The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. Good morning, fam. I'm Carl Mack, and I'm sitting in this morning for Brother Ben Dixon, who's out on assignment. Today, let's start this, even though we're past Black History Month, with our Black History Moment of the Day. Hey, Google, what happened on this day in Black history? On March 1st, 1914, writer Ralph Ellison was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. His critical and artistic reputation rests largely on a single masterpiece, Invisible Man. Ellison also achieved acclaim as an essayist, largely due to his two books, Shadow and Act, 1964, and Going to the Territory, 1986, 1987. Among his numerous awards is the Medal of Freedom awarded by President Nixon in 1969. Adapted from Black Heritage Day 4 calendar by author, lecturer, and civil rights activist Dr. Carl Mack. Well, good morning, Brother Ellison. So, Dwayne, if we could, I want to bring a couple of brothers uh, on the scene who's going to be joining us this morning to talk about uh, this morning on the Ben Dixon Show, the latest developments in Russia's attack on Ukraine. So joining me this morning, former White House aide, Brother Al Rutherford, and my favorite wing man, Captain Bone Barnes, and the man who has it hard on the queen, Brother Marcus. Welcome, brothers. Good, good morning, Brother Mac. How are you? Good morning. Good to see good. you, my wing man. There you go. So, gentlemen, listen, it was February 24th, I believe, of, of this uh, of last month when Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. And given that Russia... It's considered the home of some of the greatest chess players in the world. We saw Putin make his chess move of taking his 150 plus thousand troops and surrounding Ukraine with, I believe, the expectation of, in as few moves as possible, being able to call a checkmate. Now, it is apparent that there were some miscalculations at this point made by uh, Putin. So at this point, I want to turn it over to you, brothers, and, and let's talk about the current state of affairs and what we would consider some of the miscalculations. So, Brother Rutherford, if you can join in on that and, and give me what you think uh, are the latest developments that indicate some level of, of mis, uh, maybe underestimating, if you will. Well, well Dr. Mack, again, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and let's, let's just jump on in here. I, I, I think the 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 key mistake or miscalculation, and, and there have been several. First, let's recognize that this situation isn't going the way that Putin expected. And I think if you look at, one, the resolve of the Ukrainian people and the, the leadership uh, that Zelensky is showing when he was given the opportunity to uh, leave the battlefield to leave Kiev uh, via a kilo lift. He was uh, he, he responded by saying, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. And so mm -hmm. let's let's understand the resolve of the people, because a man fighting for his home will always fight harder than the other guy. OK, mm -hmm. number two, I would say, uh, is is the unity around NATO. Uh, previously under other administrations, and we know who, there was a direct effort to break up NATO, to, to, to embarrass NATO. And, and the current administration has had to rebuild those relationships and alliances. And I think when you, when you look at what is taking place now, the, the NATO alliance is, is very well intact and they are moving, moving forward together. Uh, third, I would say the, the internal protests that are taking place in Russia, that is, uh, that is almost unheard of. Uh, I believe around 2,000 people have been arrested. So people in Russia aren't buying the line that, that Putin is, is putting out there. So that's got to be a, a, a miscalculation on his part. And I think that's because he has become isolated from, from what is taking place and he has surrounded himself with people who are willing to just say uh yes sir yes boss and, and 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 keep it moving and then i would say the the fourth thing is he can't get to his money uh, mm. his rainy day fund is, is out of reach when you see countries like switzerland come in and say hey 
we're going to renounce our normal neutral position and we are going to follow the EU sanctions as well. That's a significant statement. That's a significant statement. Cannot be underplayed. This man cannot get access to the six hundred and eighty billion dollars that he put away to help manage this particular set of sanctions. Now, yeah. what's particularly concerning to him or, or w- it would be if I were in his position, one is the fact that the ruble has cratered. It's, it's worth less than a penny. Less than and a penny. less than a penny. And the fact that the Russian stock market cannot even open. This mm. is not how he envisioned uh, things six days into uh, this conflict or, or into this war. So and, and that's, so, that's yeah, kind of how I see it real quick. Well, it appears to be some real miscalculations. Captain Tony Barnes, a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Bones, welcome aboard. Hey, thank you, uh, Brother Mac, a wingman, affectionately known as the Noodle. I will uh, appreciate I appreciate that. And Al, you're spot on. Mm-hmm. The biggest travesty from the Russian perspective is the total miscalculation of what to expect. They never expected that the Ukrainians would destroy nearly 700 of their armored vehicles. Mm. They never expected that 50 of their aircraft and 150 of their tanks would be destroyed by what they considered to be a ragtag third rate military Mm. consisting of only 204,000 troops. Heck, they amassed nearly 200,000 of their own troops on the border and figuring that that was going to be enough. And so the miscalculation, like like Al said, uh, when you're fighting for home, when you're fighting for a mom and dad and, and the kids, your resolve is immeasurable. It's difficult for any military uh, operation to, to underscore just how hard these people would fight. And they're fighting, uh, <laughs> they're arresting Russian troops uh, getting them out of their vehicles, et cetera, in some of these towns. And you got folks with uh, double barrel shotguns and, and, and low powered rifles, come, wow. you know, next to the Russian military. Who would have ever thought? Mm-hmm. But once again, as a military mind and as a graduate of the Naval War College, I go back to the beginning, the basis, the king, the master of military strategy. Over 1,600 years ago, Sun Tzu wrote a book on the art of war. Mm -hmm. And you've got to go back to the art of war to understand the basics. And if you're not following the basics, you're going to have a problem. So know your enemy. And in 100 wars, you will have 100 victories. Mm -hmm. And you never underestimate the moral and the background of a homeland defender. Sun Tzu said, the best way to win a war is to never fight one. Right. And speaking of that, Bone, Marcus, I I know that that, that's certainly been, uh, I think, not only your position, but all of our positions is that, you know, hopefully we we never could have fought this war. So based on where we are today, give us your thoughts, my brother. Yeah, and um, and this is the thing, too, is like, I would say, open and honestly, Dr. Mac, you got me 100% nailed to rights. You were right. I was wrong. Um, I didn't think, and I think there's a lot of people who didn't expect Putin to do this. Uh, the, 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 the cards are, were looking like another like situation with Crimea and not full-scale invasion. You said it was going to happen. I said I didn't think so. So first off, hey, <laughs> you got me. Hey, um, listen, Marcus, just but, a couple of brothers just just tossing up some ideas. But let me be clear <laughs> with you, Marcus. Let me be clear. That brother sitting to your right, Mr. Al Rutherford, made it very clear to me that that, that Putin was going to do this. And I, I asked him, I said, hey, hey, and, yeah, hey, well, maybe, hey, <laughs> brother Al, we got to talk. Let's let's keep circles. Um, but <laughs> now that we're now that we're no doubt, here no doubt. and um and, and and this is the thing is like I like there's there's a lot and it's very you know kind of important to, to keep on like what's going on and what's the situation. Um I'm very interested in, you know, where where we can go from here into get to getting peace. Um I think like uh like everyone's already pretty much laid out very accurately, this isn't going uh 
probably as as Putin expected. Um, but I think one one thing is important is that he's not stopping. Um, you know, I think it was this morning. There's some vi- footage released of of uh, some government buildings mm-hmm. um, in Kharkiv getting hit. Um, and I think that this escalation can be expected, which, you know, I'm already extremely saddened by the loss of life, you know, and having other, other military veterans, we can understand that, you know, especially there's two, these two year conscripts in, in Russia are largely just kids that, that don't know what they're doing. So this is just a, a very, very sad situation. Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing like where, you know, everyone thinks that, what are the actual steps towards peace? You know, because Putin isn't, it doesn't seem like he's going to stop. Um, right. It seems he's absolutely willing to subject, subjugate Ukraine to violence, subjugate his own population to what's going to be the brunt of these sanctions, right? These sanctions aren't going to, to really hurt the oligarchs that much. They're going to be okay. Well, well, um, well, well, it's going to hurt the, the people. But. Let's get no, I kind of want to see yeah, if, if, if where, you know, since he's keeping going since, you know, like, is it just continuing on the sanctions or, you know, is there some way to give to stop the fighting or, you know, is this going to escalate into, you know, other militaries, potentially NATO forces? Um, yeah, I'm wondering if we could kind of explore where this goes from here in some of these sides. Good, good. And, and, and that'll be hey. a good segue, because one of the things that happened is uh, negative 45, uh, Donald Trump uh, made over this past weekend the assertion that Joe Biden was dumb, uh, Putin was smart and brilliant, and said that he didn't think much would come about as part of $2 sanctions, that basically Putin is going to go into Ukraine for nothing more than $2 sanctions. And so let's talk about these sanctions, if you will. Because I think, uh, Mr. Rutherford, as you alluded, one of the things that I think Putin uh, underestimated was the unity behind NATO. And so uh, for, for those who, who, who may not understand, based on what NATO did, and I, I think the, the organization is called SWIFT, and, and what SWIFT basically is, it's the Gmail system for the international banking system. And they've cut Putin off from that. And SWIFT is an acronym that stands for, and let me get this right, Society for Worldwide International Finance and Telecommunications. And so when you're locked out of that, you got to imagine that there are over 11,000 companies and businesses expanding over 200 countries. And when they lock you out of that, your money outside of Russia basically goes to zero. So right now, one ruble, and the ruble has crushed, has fallen to historic lows. One ruble is less than a penny in the United States. So when we talk about these sanctions, because I wasn't quite sure what these sanctions was going to look at look like. So, so Captain Barnes, if you could jump right in there and give me your thoughts of, of how these sanctions can affect uh, the Russian economy and, and possibly deter Putin from moving much further into this situation. Well, as you know, it, it, takes money, it takes money to wage war, and war is very, very expensive. Mm. And, and I totally agree with Brother Al. As I, I saw from the get-go that this was just not a posturing event on the border, that he was definitely going to go forward. You know, people don't realize that Russia isn't really what we would consider on an international theme. It not a, it's not a wealthy country. And so to spend the kind of money it takes to move nearly 200,000 troops into position, you don't just do that as a saber rattling move. So he was always intending, in my opinion, to go into that country in some way, shape or form. Yes. Um, and so these sanctions, we knew the international uh, <coughs> uh, uh, folks knew that finance financial sanctions and what it was going to take to, to ratchet up the pain. And so they're not instantaneous. It's not like, you know, putting our troops on the other side of the border and daring to come across. These sanctions takes days or maybe even weeks or maybe months to really feel the full punch of it. And that's really the only card we have to play. Short of sending troops in, and we were not going to. And I agree, it's it's never a part of our strategy in this case, to send boots 
American boots or NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine and engage the Russians uh, toe to toe. That right, would right, be right. Uh, terrible. So sanctions okay. were the, the obvious move, the best move. And we're seeing even in the short term, they're causing pain. And these oligarchs that are used to having um, the world at their fingertips right. uh, don't have access to that money. And it's, it's going to bleed soon. Now, 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 Al, speaking of the oligarchs and NATO, uh, and, and Marcus, I want you to, to, to give some thought to this as well. It, it's been said that it's been a while since anybody has seen NATO as unified uh, as they are right now. And, and, and you know, I, I, for one, was a little doubtful of the way that Biden was handling it. But it appears, uh, contrary to what Negative 45 has said, is, is that Biden has done something. And so, so can you speak to the, the unity of NATO and what the impact of these sanctions is having on these Russian oligarchs, if you will? Sure, sure. Uh, well, first, let me go back to the Crimea situation, because mm -hmm. when he rolled, when Putin rolled into Crimea, he basically didn't pay a price. OK, he didn't lose a single soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, the sanctions didn't really. Uh, make him back up or, or rethink his position. So he came into this equation thinking that it was largely going to be the same. And, and that's where, uh, where, where he has really made a strategic blunder. When you, when you look at the, the work that Biden had to do, President Biden had to do to rebuild the alliance the, the NATO alliance, that was significant. Mm -hmm. Then you have a new German chancellor coming in. Uh, I think everyone fairly well knew Angela Merkel after over a decade in office uh, as German chancellor, knew where she stood. You've got a, a, a new chancellor in Schultz coming in who's been in the job less than, than two months. He came to the United States, met with President Biden, and I have to believe that it was it was during that meeting that they really uh, uh, formed uh, this 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 relationship that that has allowed for NATO to to stay strong. And and I I, I say that because shortly after the invasion, Schultz cut off sanctions with Nord Stream 2. And that's a significant move because Germany gets the bulk of their oil and gas from Russia. But 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 he was saying that look, we're going to make this move. This is something that has to be done because what we're looking at is democracy under threat. And, and if you allow Ukraine or, or if you allow Putin to go in and, and pays no price, then where's he going to go next? Moldova, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, pick one. So the sanctions, while, while they do take time, are having a direct effect right now. Because as you noted, the oligarchs can't get to their money either. They can't fly their jets into London or into Miami. You know, they've cut off landing rights for these these extremely high net worth individuals. And and their comfort is something that, that they enjoy and they are not used to. I think that is part of the reason that you've actually seen eight oligarchs come out against the war. And this mm. is unheard of. They are on record doing this. Uh, and, and, and Al, let me let, let me let Marcus jump in here for a second, because Marcus, you know, even with, with what we've seen in Russia, I mean, I think it's unheard of. And, and Al, I think you, you originally said it was 2000. I think it's closer to 6000 people who have been arrested. So so so, Marcus, if you could give us your, your insight to, to how the Russian people themselves are taken to what Putin has done on this invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, and and that's where I think there's been a great international so, show of support for the Ukrainian people first and foremost. Um, and you know, uh, I've 
I, I want to, you know, mention a, a, a short little you know, book of, as well as like when uh, Smedley Butler talked about war is a racket and who war is actually serving. And, and, and to the point where none of this is helping the Ukrainian people. None of this is helping the Russian people. Um, this is, yeah, rich billionaires, extremely wealthy to the point of powerful international people that are making these decisions. And and this is where like things get extremely complicated because when it comes to the demands of what Putin wants, in 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 a way that was supported by a, a significant group of, of Russians, i.e. the independence of the Donbass region, um, and then also Ukraine neutrality in NATO. Those things are largely supported by Russian citizenry and the Duma, you know, the oligarchy. Where Putin went too far was going past and then trying to, you know, uh, and invading the entire country. Um, and there's been mass protest in response to that. And I will say this, it's, it's not too unheard of. I mean, Putin is not liked in Ukraine. There's been mass protests against a myriad of his actions in and outside of Russia. Um, and this is another example of that. Um, and but I mean, I guess to my question uh, is, I, I guess, yeah, well, you know, how many Ukrainian people are going to have to suffer? Um, because at this point, we know Putin isn't going to give up. You know, then the sanctions do take a long time to work. And I'm I'm going to ask the same question that I asked before was, is 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 Ukraine being in NATO even like is it can we at least discuss a neutrality, neutral position? And and this is where there was a much better chance before Finland, before uh, before uh, Sweden started uh giving weapons you know now they're they're pulling back from their neutrality now they're you know giving weapons to ukraine which i understand that but i feel like there was a point in time when neutrality where neutral countries could have taken you know a hold and say all y'all stop let's just you know bring them completely out of the fold of these powerful forces um and that that time is gone but is there a way to get back to that and 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 this is where like even using it as a way to get peace, get people to the discussion p- table, I think is very much worth because, like, people are dying right now. So, so Mark, Marcus, you're of the opinion that if a, a, a deal was struck that guaranteed that Ukraine would not be a part of NATO, you think that that could be a resolution to ending uh, this invasion? I mean, I can't predict the future, but, I, I, you know, we can look at history. And historically... When Ukraine is neutral, there is no invasion. Historically, yes. when new, when Ukraine is friendly to Russia, obviously there's no invasion. We Got need it. to look at these things seriously, juxtapose that with the lives that are being lost right now, and say, is this something worth talking about to get to the tables, to get to at least a ceasefire to something? Yeah, and, and speaking of lives being lost, Dwayne, I believe that we have a clip if you will, of a Russian soldier uh, that was read that he texted his mother about what his thoughts were and what he was told going into. So, Dwayne, if we have that clip and if you can cue it up and, and bone, I want you to give us some insight from a soldier's perspective of based on the clip that we're about to see. OK, you want me to look at the clip first? OK, so oh. it's, it's just the image. So so it says. Why has it been so long since you responded? Are you really in training exercise? Mom, I'm no longer in Crimea. I'm not in training sessions. And she responds, well, where are you then? Pop is asking whether I can send you a parcel. What kind of parcel, Mama, can you send me? Just just want to hang out myself. What are you talking about? What happened? Mom, I'm in Ukraine. This is a real war raging here. I'm afraid we're bombing all the cities together, even targeting civilians. We were told that they would welcome us. And they are falling under armored vehicles, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascists. Mama, this is so hard. So so Bone, it it, it appears from this perspective that this Russian soldier was not told what 
really what what Putin's real plans were. So, so Dwayne, if you could take us back to to the four of us, and, and so Bone, what I want to do is, it, 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 am I overreaching there of saying that if this is indeed a text between a Russian soldier and his mama, and based on what he was saying, am I overreaching to say that it appears that he wasn't told the real reason that he was going into Ukraine? And, and maybe what does that mean? Does that give you some insight into possibly the morale of Russian soldiers just based on this one incident that we got insight? To? Absolutely. You, you are spot on. You can take all the high tech weaponry, all of the uh, intel, all of the entire war machine. And war is not fought and won with airplanes and rifles and tanks. Wars are fought and won on the hearts and mind of soldiers and the, 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 the profession of military science is based on what I'm told and what I believe. Now, even in a country like Russia, these folks don't just blindly follow the leadership and, 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 and jump up and down like robots. They have to believe in the mission and you have to believe that what you are doing is for the right purpose. That's why soldiers go to war. That's why military men are willing to give their lives for their country when they understand that it's a noble cause and that there is a, a true reason for doing what we're doing. And you can't ask somebody to sit out in the cold and the mud and, and starve. And I mean, these guys are not. I mean, logistics really, to me, is a standout for this entire war. You can't take 190,000 troops and amass them on the border and tell them to go over the hill. And you got no beans and no bullets and no fuel to do the mission. So it, it's a failed mission from the beginning. And when as a soldier or a military person, you tell me that you want me to put my life on the line for something that is a I realize later down the road is a bunch of B.S., Mm. And you're going to have troops who either, you know, hand over their weapons to the bad guys or turn around and go home. That's that's kept that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah. So, so listen, can I just ask a coming. question? You go ahead. It, it, is, is it true? Is, is there a saying in the military that an army is only as good as its supply lines? An army can Absolutely. only go as far as its supply lines will take. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. And so if you saw the early video of these some of these convoys coming into Ukraine from uh, from Belarus, what kind of convoy was that? It was six or eight or 12 or 10 vehicles. Mm -hmm. Where was the, the fuel tanker? Where, where was the as we call it? Where was the chow wagon at? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you got a, enough MREs and, and those kind of things in the back of the tank to last you for about two or three days. But you've got a choice, carry child or, or carry armament. <laughs> and, and Bone, that, that certainly might be an indication of how Putin underestimated the resolve of the Ukrainian people. And so with that said, listen, gentlemen, you know, coming into tonight, you know, President Biden is obviously going to get his, his State of the Union address. And it appears that he has some, some you know, I would think far more positive things to say now than, than he had two weeks ago. And at the top of that list is the nomination for the first African-American woman to be a part of the U.S. Supreme Court. I think his, that what he has done to rally NATO. Uh, and again, you know, Marcus, as you said, when you got eight oligarchs inside of Russia who are now saying, hey, man, I'm not in favor of this war. Or you got the people of Russia now taken to the streets in protest to the sum of almost 6,000 people getting arrested. These are some unprecedented times, and it appears that unlike Trump uh, and, and what he said, it appears that maybe, you know, Marcus, am I being too soft to say that President Biden looked like he handled, he's handling this situation as of right now, I'd give him a very much a passing grade, and I was very much on the fence with him as to his handling of it. But Marcus, let me hear from you. I, I mean, I think that Biden is kind of in line with any, you know, regular presidential, you know, uh, orthodoxy, you know, saying like kind of removing Trump. <laughs> and then, you know, I think you I'm go glad you made back. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go past, you know, you ignore Trump, you know, and then I think you go back. It doesn't really matter, Republican or Democrat. You're going to have 
this general support for, you know, the international alliance. Um, I, I do think that uh, politically, you know, strictly politically, Biden has got a, a, a uphill battle to sell any of this as a win, you know, because because <clears throat> and that's that's so I, I, I don't think that any of his actions, it's more of how they sell it to the American people. And I think it's very much hard to sell any of these actions as a victory while the war is still ongoing. And, you know, and I, I do understand that, you know, these sanctions, they take time. I do understand that the oligarchs are getting hit in, in, in a little bit. But at the end of the day, the question is, where do people feel in the brunt of this? Where do they go? And I think there's a lot of people in Russia who are going to understand, hey, this is the result of what Putin is doing. But we need to question, is this going to drive them to Putin as the protector? And because also, too, is like we no longer exist in a unipolar world. We are now shifting or at least realizing that you know, U.S. NATO hegemony isn't the biggest and baddest on the block. And that's I got to wonder and I, I sorry, because I got to go take get these kids to school. But I have that's what, what I'm wondering. And I might take I'll take my answer offline for the gentleman is. D- does do what does America have to realize now that Russia and China and now in like the way Saudi Arabia is coming into these things? There's a, it's a the, the game has changed to the point where even international affairs can't be solved with the with the strong man coming in and saying don't do that, um, and so that's I, I think that's that, that that's my concern and that's what's gonna be when when it comes to Biden that lo- that perception of loss of United States power might hurt him a lot. You know, and then ongoing with, I think, what we all agree is some there's some domestic policy failures, student loan debt, you know, maybe not doing so well on on, on COVID. You know, like, I think this is going to compile into not not a good look for Biden coming down the straight. So I I agree his his actions are more in line with like U.S. president. He's, you know, being a, a, a regular, normal person on the international stage, which is, you know, well, something you know, that Marcus, we haven't I, had in a while. I, but Marcus, I, I would give you pushback in this in this sense. If if what we're hearing is that we've never seen the type of unity around NATO like we've seen now, you, you certainly got to give Biden credit for that. The other it, thing that I found, the other thing that I found absolutely amazing uh, that that Biden did, that this administration did, is that through intelligence, they were able to tap in and get Putin's playbook and announce Putin's playbook before he actually did the plays. And I got to tell you, if you're on offense and you have no timeouts and the linebacker, based on your formation, is calling out what play you're about to run, that's a little disconcerting. Well, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and Brother Mac, though, if you know the play, you better make an yeah. interception. And the interception didn't happen. The war is still going on. They knew the play. They called it. But the play is still happening. And that's that's where I'm saying it's not necessarily about the actions because and that's what I do is like, I agree. I I thought it was going to be a push into the Donbass region. He was going to try and pull another Crimea. I agree. Like they called it tooth and nail. Pull, yeah. They had a bunch of Eastern Ukrainians come across the border and, and, and then, and, and pull, you know, oh, we got to def- like they called it. But at the end of the day, and hold, the play still hold on happened. A yeah, hold on a second, Marcus. Dwayne, du- do we need to go right now? Because I know that we're running a little bit past time for Georgia. All right. Good. Listen, there's so much to unpack here. And, and look, Brother Marcus, I got to thank you. Bone Barnes, thank you so much, Brother Rutherford. And look, man, I'm going to need you guys back. So stay, stay right there uh, because I'm certainly going to need you to come back. And, and so, Marcus, do you have to run now? Uh, I got to, yeah, drop the kids at school, but I, I talked to uh, David about coming back on at nine. Okay, so, good, good. Um, so so you'll drop off and, and Bone and Al, if you could stay with me, because it's going to take all three of us to sit in and, and, and hang with our sister, Georgia Fort, who will be on the clock. So let's take a break here and then we'll be back on the clock with sister Georgia Fort. History to you, but girl is new to me. I wish that I could see it happen naturally, but I never saw it coming, baby. I never guessed that we could get this far. Well, honestly, I really don't know where we are, and would it be less fun if it was less bizarre? Cause we never saw it coming. Should have been so easy, but I'm feeling completely thinking about you. Yeah. And I would just let you be, but I consistently think about you. Oh, baby, do you think about me too? I know you're keeping secrets. Oh, 
Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, man. We got more coming up next. Oh. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, man. All right, y'all. Look back. Listen to some music till we get this show started. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. Good morning, y'all. Hope y'all can hear me. Okay. We can take my Lambo. Good morning, everybody. Mary you sure you can handle it. Shelby H. We be faster than Jacob. Yes, Brooke, Mrs. Dragon, Diana, and Tyra G. Alicia, good morning. What are you saying? What's going on? Lisa. Yeah, Miss Brooke, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'll put on a tight show. You sure you can handle it? We be faster than Jacob. Kids, I won't stop. All right, all right. Well, that's better. Better for me. All right. Snack Panther, what's going on? Good morning. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't all stop, right, won't stop. Good morning to you. Can't stop, won't stop. Brother Dragon, let's hit him. Good morning. Can't stop. Ah. Creative Impact, good morning. Promises Manifested, what's going on? Yeah. There we go. Okay. We can take my yeah, Hustler, good morning. I'll put on a tight chip. Lily, sure good you morning to you. Sunny, right? What's going on? Maybe faster than Django. Rachel Atwood, Jason Marks, good morning, y'all. Sam, good morning. Good morning, Mama and Daddy. Good morning, my sweet, sweet Sarah. I love your knees. Coming to see you today. The Big Peace, good morning. Brother Latif, what's going on? Amber, what's going on? Good morning. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, man. We got more coming up next. Can't stop. Good morning to you. A shame think something new under the sun. Hmm. You can't take back some things you already done, done. Sydney no. Butler, good morning. You blame things that you do on somebody else. Hmm. No. Brother Bryce, good morning. You need help. Mm. All right, y'all. Y'all make sure y'all uh, stay tuned. Dora does not with us this morning. But we do so have a video from her. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, man. We're going to get into that video coming up next. Mary C, good morning. So Thank you for the content. What's going on? Uh, hoping that one day uh, something oh. will change. All right, y'all. We're going to drop that video. Y'all yeah, make sure that y'all stay tuned oh, after yeah, this. Coming, coming up next, we yeah, like it or not, with Rebecca Azor. If Rebecca Azor gets in the club, <laughs> we'll see. All right, y'all. On the clock with Georgia Fort starts now. Good morning, y'all. We are tired. This journey is hard. We won't give up on our search for a hope, but nowadays it seems hard to find. It's been nearly two years since the murder of George Floyd. And in so many ways, our community is right back where we started. Most recently, Amir Locke was fatally shot by officers during the execution of a no knock warrant. Deshaun Hill, a 15-year-old honor roll student and star athlete was fatally shot in North Minneapolis. Our community expressed outrage following the sentencing of Kim Potter and all of these things compounded are making us reflect how far has our community really come. Today we discuss how we can collectively and individually continue to make progress. But most importantly, how can we heal from everything that we've been through? I invite you to join us for a conversation about healing, hope, and health. 
to help us talk about healing and hope, Tiffany Daniels, Managing Director of the Minnesota Business Coalition for Racial Equity, and Samuel Simmons, Behavioral Consultant. On the health equity side from Children's Minnesota, President and CEO, Dr. Mark Gorlick, and Vice President and Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer, James Burroughs. Welcome to our conversation about hope, healing, and health. I'm independent journalist Georgia Ford, and I want to invite you to participate in this conversation with us. If we're going to find real solutions that are going to help us heal, if we are going to restore hope in our community, it's going to take all of us doing our part and sharing what we know and what we're doing. So feel free to do so in the comments below. And please stick around. This conversation is not going to be that long. Uh, We'll be talking for about the next 30 minutes, but I do want you to stick around through the end because we have some important information about new policies, about health equity work that's happening here in the Twin Cities, and the ways in which we're all working together to combat health disparities. But first, we are in a very critical time where people are struggling to find hope. They're trying to figure out how can I heal with all of this trauma around me and Uh, I'm curious to know from each one of you, uh, how are you approaching this? How how are you incorporating some of these uh, thoughts and needs from the community within the work that you're doing? Um, One of the things that we did earlier this month for NBCRE members was a healing and action session where we invited Dr. Joy Lewis to come in and talk about this radical self-care. And we had almost 500 participants join us virtually. And it was an incredibly powerful session because there's so much power in pausing and acknowledging what's happening in the community. And it's that's different, especially for some members that work in the corporate environment. So often when you work in the corporate space, um, you kind of shed your reality when you walk in and you're really focused on the task at hand. But there's so much happening in our community around us that we are now forced to bring our whole selves, bring everything that's happening, happening in community to work and to really figure out a way. How can we pause and reflect together and then start to talk about solutions? Absolutely. You know, my work is really around uh, trauma, community trauma. Started working with male trauma because I think male trauma is always ignored, especially black male trauma. We're seen often as perpetrators and never as victims, and we're we're actually both, right? And so, in terms of so, in that view of the. Uh, dealing with men and dealing with the community, making it okay to really say, yes, this is happening to me and this is my experience and and making that okay. Because historically, we've been so used to rolling with the punches as a community, right? And at times... uh, suffering in silence until we can't take it no more and then we're out loud, right? And so part of my job lately in doing radio and doing podcasts and that kind of stuff is to really help frame what's going on. Like, for example, how does a community heal when it feels like it's under attack is really the question, right? Under attack, not just externally, but internally. Because we don't have the choice of waiting for things to stop, to heal. We, we, We have to do both, which is might seem unfair, but I think that's one of the things that probably need to be talked about more. You're talking about healing and hope, and I think if we want to have healing or hope, first first of all, we have to have honesty. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to, as we committed to as part of the CEO Action Pledge on Diversity and Inclusion, one of those pledges is to make our workplaces, uh, to encourage open and honest conversation about issues around race, equity, injustice, disparities. And so we have tried to do that. And some of it is in the context of our employee resource groups, um, but also many other venues where we've, James and I have several times engaged in conversations as part of our Grand Round series to really have these open and honest conversations where people can um, share their feelings about what's happening both internally within our organization and within our wider community um, as a first step towards generating that hope that we'll be able to actually take those issues on if we're frank about talking about them. And just like Dr. Gorlick said, one of the things we're trying to do is educate folks on other realms of trauma. 
a lot of times you focus on what happened to other people in community. You don't focus on the trauma you're causing others. So we did a, uh, a grand rounds recently called Medical Apartheid. It was a, a great book written, uh, and it was also, too, just thinks about what are we doing in the healthcare system to contribute to daily trauma that's keep going as well. The other thing we did recently was, I just thought about it, is uh, I tried to stay away from inflicting more trauma. So Amir Locke was just murdered by police uh, in a downtown apartment. Uh, rather than call this guy up and say, hey, let's write another statement because we won't run after George Floyd because it hit our hearts so much, I said, I'm going to stay away from that. I'm NBCRE, we're not going to write a statement. We're going to talk about what we're doing and not doing, and we're going to talk to the community about what needs to be done together. So inflicting trauma is sometimes just stopping what you have always done before, thought was the right thing to do, but you're actually inflicting more trauma. So I just think about that and just kind of resisted the urge this time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Sam, I know you you brought up this point of the compounded trauma, right? right? And that's impacting our children in a much different way. They're internalizing this on on multiple spectrums. Not only are they seeing people who look like them that are being killed by police, but then they're also seeing people like Deshaun Hill, who are killed, gunned down in North Minneapolis, right? And so when you think of our children internalizing all of this trauma as community leaders, what is your approach when you're thinking about ways to uh, help our children process and, and, and overcome these different griefs? Well, part of it is us as adults being willing enough to uh, really slow down enough to hear what the children are saying, right? And uh, and giving them an opportunity to say it the way they feel it. Because sometimes when kids say it the way they feel it, don't feel good as adults, right? And and realize the focus has got to be on them and not on you, right? And that's a that's a tough piece from a community that different generations have had their issues around listening to children and you know i'm old you know so my generation children didn't have no say so you know and then you have the younger generation of, of folks is like you know they suffer too you, you know and and like i remember my father told me i had no right to be depressed because he had to buy my clothes well that was old school right but uh we have to give children the opportunity to be honest about what they're feeling and be willing to say you don't know we don't always have the answers which makes, which also brings your own humanity to yourself and allows them to realize, I don't always have the answers, but, but what I'm feeling is what I'm feeling, and that's real. So how do we walk through this together? You know what? Um, not surprisingly, at Children's Minnesota, we're, we're really the kid experts. I mean, this is something that's near and dear to our hearts, and, and, um, and it is, in fact, really heartbreaking. I mean, we are in the middle of nothing short of a mental health crisis right now um, for a lot of reasons um, related to the pandemic, related to all the uh, events around racial inequity, um, increased realization around that in the last two years. Um, but we're in the middle of a mental health crisis. We've joined with other organizations in declaring that. And it is it is disproportionately affecting um, our black youth. Um, they're more than twice as likely to um, attempt or uh, think about suicide, for example. And we've seen a 50% increase in the number of kids coming to our emergency departments needing to be hospitalized. This is, you know, a couple of thousand kids a year coming in that need to be, uh, that are being seen in our emergency departments. And so part of what we are doing is we're stepping up and, you know, we, we need to deal with the entire continuum of care. We need to get upstream and prevent it, but we've got to deal with the crisis right now. And so we, um, later this year, will be opening for the first time an inpatient mental health unit that will be able to serve probably about 1,000 kids a year. Um, and we anticipate that, you know, at least half of those kids will be kids of color um, because of the disproportionate impact that they've been having. And the key for that is how we expand those services. So how we open up the mental health unit, how we look at more community partnerships. We want to make sure that we're partnering with the community and not telling them what to do. So we're the kid experts in the medicine side. The community is the community expert on the community side. So bringing them to the table to say, okay, we're opening up mental health beds. If we're not willing to listen to how a black young male may exhibit his trauma and we're going to call the police or call security or get afraid, we're not ready yet. 
if we're not going to make sure we partner with community organizations like SAM, like uh, Mother Ratoon, uh, the Cultural Wellness Center, and others as well, to make sure that it's not only culturally responsive, but that we're just listening to community as well. And also, too, realize that we can say we don't have an answer. We, don't, we have not done it right before. We've made some mistakes along the way, and we want to fix that. So how we open up that mental health unit, how we partner with the community, is something we're going to focus on at Children's as well a lot this year. Well, and I, I totally agree with that approach, you know, coming together, as I stated in the beginning of this conversation, it takes all of us, right, to play our role. And so, again, if you all are watching, would love to hear from you, your thoughts. Uh, the last question there, we're talking about children specifically internalizing all of this trauma from, you know, them watching police killings online to seeing community violence and trying to figure out how to overcome their grief for their friends, for their neighbors, for their classmates. Would love to hear from you what you're doing in community to help children uh, who are processing all of this trauma in real time. And uh, I know each one of you stated something unique that your organization or that you're doing in community to help move the needle forward with health equity, with creating healing spaces, with restoring hope. Uh, but it, it, it's not just organizations and individuals in community doing work that's going to move us forward is also going to take policy change. Because when you look at these disparities, it's not just one organization. It's not just, you know, one group over here. It is a, a systemic issue. And some of those issues need to be corrected by change in policy. So I know some of you all have partnered on different policies. Um, can you share your your thoughts if, if you're working on um, different policies right now or if you've already you know, pitched it to the House, if it's in the Senate, just catch us up on where you all are with your work on, on changing policies. Um, one of the unique things about um, NBCRE and the coalition is um, that it's a marriage of business and community, that we are at the table, business leaders and community leaders kind of partnering and having conversations about what needs to happen and what needs to change. And policy is one of the things that we talk about a lot because to your point, Georgia, um, when you think about systemic change, a lot of that leads us to the policy changes that are required. Um, so one of the things that we do at the coalition is first and foremost to take a listening ear to community. This is not about the organizations or the companies that are members of the coalition building the agenda that we want to advocate for and that we want to advance in the legislature. It's about identifying those voices in community that are experts, identifying you know those that are closest to the issues, making ourselves smart on, on that, building our empathy, and then assessing where can the business community play a role? What is the, the value that we can add to this conversation? And then building an agenda there. We've recently built our policy agenda for the current um, legislative session, and there are a number of issues on it. I mean, we're talking today, I was just at the Capitol, I'm talking about the Crown Act, mm -hmm. um, which is up for the for a vote on the House floor today, and we're trying to encourage the Senate to um, for a hearing. Um, but, you know, that is an issue that is important as we think about the ability for our black men, women, and children to show up as their first full selves at school and the workplace. Um, we, in our policy agenda, we talk about housing, right, and um, the importance of preserving and constructing affordable housing. Um, we're talking about workforce readiness and how we can increase funding for those programs. Um, we talk a lot about public safety as well and influencing the post board and all the things that are really related to the systemic changes that are really driving where we are today and what we're seeing and feeling in community. Well, <clears throat> my work is really... Uh, working with other organizations in terms of informing their policy, in terms of being, you know, having them look at different kind of ways to address their policy issues, right? Uh, one of the things that we have been we've been offering is this whole thing around compassion and accountability. How do we balance the policies that we have in terms of? of having uh, that compassion for all of our clients and all the communities and including that in the work you're doing. So, um, so it's more consulting with other organizations around that. Um, 
It, it does feel like policy just takes forever to catch up, right? Mm -hmm. And especially at a time like this where it seems like not a lot gets done at the government level. But we do need to have policies. If we're going to address structural racism, we have to have policies and that change those structures. And, um, you know, for me, I, I'm occasionally accused of being too political when I advocate for policies that affect the health and well-being of kids. And my point is we need to do that. If we're going to advocate for the health needs of kids, that means advocating for policies that affect them. We try not to be partisan about it, but we absolutely have to be political in the sense of being willing to make statements, to re do outreach to legislators and policymakers, say, these are things that harm kids. This is what you need to do to change that if we want kids to be healthier. I'd add to that, Georgia, we need to have policy and practice, too. So government relations folks at NBCRE, for all the different companies are there weighing in the policy. But it can't be that I go back to your company, your practice is out of the line with your policy statement. So one of the things we did recently is our good friend Shaletta uh, sent us a letter at NBC area. He said, great, y'all come together for all this great stuff for black people. What about black media? Are you using us? Are you leveraging us? Are you sitting down with us? Are you paying us like you're yeah. paying white media? Uh, and rather than go into policy discussions, what I talked to our VP of marketing and comms, Hillary Shea, about is how, what can we do and how can we meet? So now we've uh, engaging black media. We're paying black media. We have things that are running on black media. Uh, that's you. the practice. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, that's the practice because a lot of people say you got to wait until the policy changes. I can't do this. I got to talk to my lawyers. No, you don't. Change your practice and invest. And I, I challenge other companies to do the same. We're not perfect at children's. We never claim to be. But I challenge other companies to change your practices as well uh, yeah. to work on your policies uh, hand in hand, too. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead, sir. I mean, he bring up such a, a great point. It's like, I'm, I'm a consultant. I'm, you know, private consultant. It's interesting how folks will at, want you to come in and then you tell them how much you charge. And you already know you're charging less than their white, your white counterpart. And then they start talking to you. Well, you know, I don't know if we got the money and all like that. And, and then get their feelings hurt. Well, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And because they, they, they're not used to sometimes they're not used to folks of color that saying, no, I'm not doing that. That's right. You know, and and so those practices leads to better policy changes. Right. And using the, uh, the black media, because the thing is, is some of our disparities in our community is about with the, the community haven't had time to sit back and understand because the community is only as strong as the information it's given. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, just dealing with my clients, there's a lot of things that we assume they they should know, but they don't know because they're struggling with their trauma every day. So they're in the moment. They're not. And so as as leaders and that kind of stuff, if we're not giving them the information in a language they understand. Then we're just, you know, pontificating to make ourselves feel good. You know, and I call that, you know, emotional masturbation, just saying stuff that makes you feel good, not doing nobody else any good. So. It just sounds funny. <laughs> not emotional masturbation. <laughs> but to his other point <laughs> about knowing your worth, uh, trauma is inflicted in our community in the business setting, too. Right. We've been traumatized so much, especially as black people, we undervalue ourselves and our work. So people have come to me before and said, hey, James, this is what I charge. I'm like, well, this is what was charged 20 years ago. Right. Right. Go back and look at what the market started. You're valuable. You're great at what you do. Right. And I've had to, on occasion, push prices up to consultants and contractors to say, this is what you're worth. Right. This is what other people are charging. So that trauma affects our business community as well. Yes. Well, and that's what true <laughs> equity looks like. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And not asking people in communities of color to come to the table to volunteer or to share their ideas or mm -hmm. expertise to move the needle on something that you're going to get funding on. That's not equity. That might be inclusion, but that's not equity. equity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, topic about policy circling back to policy change. Uh, James, you talked about it not just being about policy. We can't always wait for the policy to catch up or nor should we. Sometimes we can take action on our own within the companies we work in, within the communities we live in, where we go to church. We can start to shift culture by our own choices. But there are some things specifically in our community where we do need policy change. And I've seen, when, when circling back to you know the hope and the healing piece, I've seen a lot of people lose hope 
uh, when you you look at changes in in local policing because we haven't seen the change in policy. Right. And so uh, what do you say to those people? And I know nobody here, none of us are experts on policing. That's not what I'm asking us to discuss. But when everybody was paying attention and it's hard sometimes in our community, get people to pay attention to policy change. Mm -hmm. But everybody was ch paying attention to policy change for policing and the government didn't deliver there. You know, there's hold up in the Senate, even on a federal level. The George Floyd Policing Act w wasn't passed despite global response to his murder, right? So how do we get our community engaged and restore hope that we can get the policies that we need, that, that we can get our political leaders on board to invest and vote in policies that are going to produce more equitable outcomes? I mean, I think first in to the community engagement piece, it starts with just that, staying engaged and it, recognizing that policy change does take a very long time, right? Like we are trying to dismantle systems that were, were um, erected over hundreds of years. And so there is a little bit of patience required. Um, and also recognizing that the context can sometimes shift and um, it can change the, the conversation around something, right? And the urgency around it may feel different, right? So if the topic around, you know, no knock warrants, for example, comes up two years ago, um, there may be something like we're dealing with right now that makes that conversation feel more timely. And then you have another opening to have that policy conversation. Um, but you have to have that um, foundation or that context that, this takes a long time, but you cannot give up, right? Like the policy change, given that it does take a long time, it is one of the places where we have to stay focused as a community. You know, I think sometimes it's so difficult for community because, again, they're struggling with that everyday life in terms of the, the, the trauma. But um, one of the things that I do know that, um, when we talk about community safety, the relationship with the police and the community is very, very important for community safety. You know, we might want to think, you know, we talked, you know, the thing came up about defunding the police or whatever, but we got different people in our communities who don't know no other way, right? I mean, I'm, you know, even though I look good, but I'm an old man. And so if you, if you attack me, I'm calling the police. At the same time, I have a difficult relationship with them at the same time. And so, so how, do we, how do we work through that, right? But, but if we really want uh, part of the issue around community safety is that relationship. And we have to approach these powers to be that if you, if you say you're really in on this, we really need to look at that from a relational kind of thing. If you say this relationship is important, in your, in your response will let me know how important this relationship is to you. I hate to be a downer, but I, I have to tell you, you know, when I talk to some of my white colleagues and family and so on, I, and I hear the, um, compared to two years ago, the at best indifference and, and to many, to a large extent, a backlash, I, I'm not all that optimistic that policies are going to change anytime soon. But to get back to James's point, and this is what I appreciate so much about James is, is he pushes me this way is say, look, in the meantime, what are we going to do to, to, to act differently and to show up differently both to our, the patients and families that come to us and in our community while we wait for those policies to catch up? Yes. And it has to be consistency. I mean, the, the reality is if you live with a house that's a Democratic house, a Senate that's Republican Senate, and you still have bipartisan politics, um, people may vote a certain way. But if you show up every day, all day, each hearing, making sure you contact your representatives, you can see change. When I worked for Governor Dayton's office, Flandreau Castile was shot and killed by police, murdered by police. There was no conviction. But people consistently started to show up, the Castile family. Other families started to show up. When George Floyd happened, those families mobilized together. And although we're not there yet by any means, some public safety legislation did get passed two years ago. Uh, but to Mark's point, it's not enough. So we want to make sure we keep doing that as well. And the other thing I'll say is you got to make sure that you are dealing with your own trauma as you are protesting, as you are marching, as you are on the Capitol uh, as well. Short story, Georgia, uh, and this is part of my trauma I'm sharing just today. 
uh, last Thursday in front of my house. Police come, they smash into a vehicle right in front of my house, right in front of my doorway, and then six police cars are surrounding a gentleman, a gentleman, someone who's in the car with guns. He puts his hands out the window. I'm watching for 10 to 15 minutes from my window, five feet away, AR-15, shields, and everything. I'm like, man, am I another Darnella Frazier about to capture this on video and deal with my own trauma? They got him out of the car, and they didn't do any harm to him. I found out a news story later that this same guy was around the complex that I live in shooting bullets, about 40 bullets, prior to this happening. I left five minutes before with my daughter, got back five minutes before sitting on my couch in front of that, that he could have been shooting up, and some people in the complex were shot. My point is, I got to deal with that trauma as a black man yeah. and making sure that I can still fight forward and push forward around that. And that's not easy, yeah. you know, because I've been fighting for this for a long time. It took me a while. I'm, this whole weekend, I was like, you know what, JB, what do you do? And part of calling Sam... Uh, it's funny, I called Sam before that happened. The Lord was like looking out like, man, Sam's here now. That's your boy. Y'all need to talk through that and chat through that too. So part of that pushing forward and being policy and practice and all that, we got to take care of ourselves. We got to heal from within and also talk with each other as well. So and That's not a regular practice for our community. Right. So there's a teaching moment internally we have to do. So it's got to be internal and external. And not everybody's good at different stuff. I'm not good at, you know, marching or whatever. But the things I'm good at, I'm willing to share with each other, both the system and our people. So so to, to be more objective, because it is, uh, as I mentioned, this whole battle of feeling under attack externally and internally, which no community should have to go through, but we don't, we, we, we have to deal with what, what's given. And it's complicated. It's yes. complex. There's layers. <laughs> right. There's a dynamic approach that we can take to finding solutions for restoring hope, for our healing, for combating these health disparities. And I feel like in many ways, we're just now starting to scratch the surface. But as we prepare to wrap up our conversation, are there other things that we haven't touched on that you think are important for uh, our audience to hear, for our community to know about the work that you're doing, or maybe even just things that you, you want to leave people with? James, you gave a great point about take care of yourself. That's so critical. I mean, as we're fighting to move the needle forward, trying to combat some of these disparities, it's easy to say, oh, I'll take care of myself tomorrow. But if we don't take care of ourselves, if we're not here, we can't keep fighting the fight. So um, as we wrap up, any final words you'd like to leave our audience with today? Um, one of the things that I think keeps me engaged and keeps that fire in my belly is just the reminder of how urgent this work is. And when I think about the work of the coalition and us coming together after the murder of George Floyd, that need is still there. And so on those days when the conversation is difficult or um, our white counterparts and allies may not have that same fire and they don't feel that same urgency. I'm reminded of the tremendous need in community um, and also the importance of fortifying myself as a leader in this work to then show up in a certain way. Right. It's you know, I have the lived experience as a black person and being here and I'm experiencing it all just like everyone in community. Um, but then having to, you know, do my self-care and be relentless about it so that I can show up and lead the conversations and continue to push our corporate community towards action. Well, one of the things is I know that we're, you know, it was, was mentioned that some of my white counterparts are all worried about violence and have their approach and that kind of stuff. But I want to leave them with this. When you are dealing with folks who are highly traumatized, punishing them, don't improve nothing. Because if you know how to be, because a lot of our young people, unfortunately, know how to be punished, but they don't know how to be loved. So think about that if you really want to get uh, some real outcomes in the long term. I know you know this. Minnesota has some of the biggest health disparities in the country. Um, not because everybody else is doing it great. It's just we happen to be the worst of, of the worst. But um, you know, so we've got a lot of work to do. We're not going to fix it ourselves, but I can tell you that at Children's Minnesota, we are committed to addressing health equity. We've made it an organizational priority. Um, we, we are working on closing those gaps, both 
in what we do within our walls and then really trying to partner more authentically with our community to figure out how do we address those multiple things that are contributing to that. And I'll finish by saying we're also hiring more diversity as well. So of the last eight to 900 people, we've hired 40% of those have been people <coughs> of color. And we have a goal every year to hire 34% people of color, not across, across the board, but also in leadership roles too, to increase that diversity. And we started off when I came, 0% of the people reporting to the CEO were people of color. Now 33% are black, uh, you know, in different leadership roles. Hold us accountable, I'll say, to the community as well. So we're doing some good stuff. I'm proud of it. But check me when you need to, as I used to say growing up in Detroit. Check me, say, hey, you're not doing up and showing up where you need to show up. I'll keep doing that. But also, too, hold others accountable. Don't let them just come to your space and place and say what they're going to do or pretend to do. Hold them accountable uh, as well. And then the last piece about, you know, self-care. Uh, just so you all know, I'm the worst at self-care. I got 20 million mentees. I got 20 million things to do. So hold me accountable, too. When I say that out loud, part of me saying that was, hold me accountable. Say, hey, JB, we got this. We got you, too. So uh, hold your friends accountable. Lift them up as well and love them. As Sam just talked about, it's easy to punish each other. It's easy to talk about each other. It's hard to love each other in a community that's been so traumatized. Yeah, absolutely. Well, James... Dr. Gorlick, Sam, Tiffany, I so appreciate you being here today and the work that you all are doing in our community to make it better, to improve some of these inequities that we have. And I think that it's important to have these conversations so that we're connected, so that we're aware that there are people in this community who, who truly care and who want to see uh, improvement in some of these spaces. And so I just, I truly thank you all. And I want to encourage those of you who are watching to share ways that you're working to move the needle in our community. Uh, and just know that you're not, you're not doing this work alone. So thank you all for being here and thank you for watching. Take care. Today's conversation was made possible with support from the kid experts at Children's Minnesota. So Georgia Ford and the work that she's doing. Awesome, awesome, awesome work. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that, man. Make sure that you leave some comments, man, and words of support for Georgia, that man. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. Like it or not, it's coming up next for Bella Azori in the building. Good morning, everybody. Everybody that uh, attended the patron party. I hope that you were able to uh, go get you guys the burgers that we discussed at the patron party. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And a whole bag of them. It was awesome. All right, y'all. Make sure that y'all stay tuned. <laughs> Five hours. Of, tell me you, you know, know what? Never so. mind. <laughs> but now you're saying you have to go, just like a lightning from a clear sky. And to the guy who invented zero, goodbye. thanks for nothing. There's nothing but a cloudy sky, and there's no day. What's the good morning? Good morning. And that was all of y'all. I ain't do nothing but play. All I do is spin records. Still up there, so you ain't getting nothing this morning yet. Leave me alone. Anyway, y'all, we're
we're gonna get it to our new Twitch subscribers that we have. Yvonne Trey, resubscribe. Yvonne Trey, subscribe. Welcome to the Industrial Arts. Resubscribe. Been subscribed for 11 months. Andy from Ohio, resubscribe. And they have been subscribed for 16 months. Shout out, Andy. At Jam Tomb, resubscribe. They've been subscribed for 11 months. Fellow Twitch streamer, Marcus for Left Flank Vets. What's going on, Marcus? Resubscribed as well, and it's been subscribed for six months. I I um I. I re I um I no I messed it up. Resubscribe and commented. I'm so sick of my white liberal friends complaining to me how China treats ethnic minorities. It's like, hello, let's look in the mirror, America. <laughs> They've been subscribed for two months. Agnostic Sister resubscribed, been subscribed for five months. Jam Tomb gifted subscriptions to Stream Elements and Neon Death 07. An anonymous user dun, 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 gifted a community subscription. Now, let me find out. Anonymous is, is watching us. Murderino Dragon resubscribed, they've been resubscribed for nine months. ABTAR143 gifted subscriptions to Epsta68, OG Prodigy Twitch, and fellow streamer $27. $27 like that. And the Chicken Fried Dragon also gifted a six month subscription. Okay, Chicken Fried Dragon to the Pascal Show. So shout out Chicken Fried Dragon, man. When I tell you, she is all over the place. Like Coming through, you know she got a <laughs> Welcome to Zoom, Rebecca. Welcome to Zoom. Oh, it looked like that. It sounded like that dirty Florida bass. <laughs> That's my dog. Do you remember how you sound in Florida? Show. He's a politics pro. Right. <laughs> Y'all know who I am. Stay dropping them all over the place. <laughs> like it or job. not, it's going down. Like it or not, y'all stick around. Oh, like it or not, it's dark. Or not with Benjamin Dixon starts now. Right. Hell. Oh. Good yeah, morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Girl, your hair. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all over the You ain't even let me get the good morning out. Look, bubble. Let me you, try to get a you good morning. Right. You ain't hear me when you was talking. I told her her hair was taking up most of her screen. It is. Right. <laughs> it is. I feel well, like good I need morning. To... Welcome to Like It or Not. Well, we're free to tell the truth and not care who doesn't like it. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus, how are you? I hear that. We just Ooh, you know, I look so we never digital. run into each other. Well, that's. I thought there was a, some type of, you know, conspiracy going on, you know, and like one time, <laughs> hey, that's a coincidence. Two times, oh, you know, don't worry about it. I know Rebecca is busy as hell, but it's like four or five times. And I, was, I had the question. I was like, what's up? Did I say something wrong? You know, I was just kind of curious because, but I'm happy to be here. You know, <laughs> finally, the, 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 the powers have conjoined and, and, and we're about to blow the Internet up. And we both got a little right. side piece. We both got a little side piece going on with the hair. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Um, no, there was like, it was never a reason. That's that fine. You see it? It's giving me bang. It's I got a beard. Cool Look. <laughs> yeah. And that works too. That works too. But it was never that we, um, it was never a conspiracy theory. I just never knew um, when you would come on. Uh, I would just turn on the TV from my busy day because I'm booked and busy, right? 
for the corporate world. I would just turn on the television um, and then see you. And I'm like, who is this man? Who is this man? And finally, I've gotten an opportunity to be on the show with you. Um, so thank you for coming on today and filling in for yes. the powers that used to be. Rebecca runs it today and every day on this show. <laughs> <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's so much going on in the world, and um, I want you to be a part of the conversation. So I wanted yeah. to start off by, um, you know, it, it, it is Women's History Month. I know that Black History Month is over, and the white people are relieved that all of the Black History stuff is going to go on sale and be out of the store and out of their views in um, just a few days here. But, you know, for us, black history never ends. And for a moment for us to celebrate, black people will never end. Black history is for us every single day. Celebrating black people is for us every single day. Um, and it is Women's History Month. So you know what we do with that. We just going to take black women <laughs> and um, talk about black women for Women's History Month. Um, and I wanted to just mention quickly, um, you know, the new Supreme Court justice um, and, you know, yes. her making history um, being a black woman. And, you know, first and foremost, again, it is Black History Month. I mean, not black. You know, it might as well be Black History Month, but it's Women's History Month. And um, a lot of people wanted to make such a big deal about Katanji Brown um, Jackson being nominated. Um, and I think, and I mean, a lot of people like white folks, they have themselves up in arms about this. They're making it such a big situation saying that, you know, this is what America has come to. We're focusing on, you know, um, nominating somebody or putting somebody in this space because of this, their skin color. Well, that's why we ain't put them in that, that space before because of their skin color, right? So now we're looking at the credentials. Um, we're looking at the fact beyond them being um, a woman or, 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 or male or whatever. Um, and it just sucks that we have to be in a time where we're still in a place where it's the first black. But if you think that we're not going to congratulate and celebrate that moment because it is a big deal for us um, with the historical limits um, that have been placed on black people, um, no matter their credentials, no matter their qualifications, I'm glad that we are able to get to this point. So shouts out to Katenji Brown um, for this. And women. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think to the, <laughs> to the point, too, is that when it comes to <laughs> black people having the credentials to be on the, this United States Supreme Court, that's been since day one. You tell me that Frederick Douglass could have done a better job than, than the rest of these racists that, that occupied these positions for so long. So this is not some type of new phenomena that even white America wants to, to project of like, well, now it's time because we've invested in black people to make them qualified. Black people been qualified. And and so I think it's mm -hmm. like that 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 brings that finally really into perspective is that yes. we're talking about it, it. If things were fair, if things were about um, your actual work, it <laughs> It wouldn't have like it wouldn't have taken this long, but that's why we're here. And um, politically, though, I think the Biden administration shouldn't have said anything. I think they should have just came out with a list of all black women and then watch them squirm. But you know, mm. we're here now mm. um, because. But and yeah, you know, I, I'll just say that is that this is a, a, a finally that I think needs to be all caps and three explanation points because mm -hmm. black people have always been qualified for any of these Ooh. positions. Ooh, that yes, part, yes. Look, that part right and there. And y'all, um, for, and forgive me, y'all, for my choppy internet today. This, I got the family internet going on, so forgive me, y'all. Okay, it's giving full ten second delay. We don't know when to come in. We don't know when to go. But see them. I, you see what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Once I hear you, I just I'm gonna stop speaking to make sure you get up in there. How about that? Hey, you know, you know what it is, Bubba. Your your internet wasn't ready for Rebecca to be on time today. It, it just shot. Mm. That's what it was. It just shot the whole system. We're just throwing it. Shots fired. It, it shot everything. When she said I'm here, I'm like, God dang, it's it's nine a.m. and she's mm -hmm. on on time. Right, right. And so I'll say this. Yesterday. Uh, oh, God. Here we go. I, <laughs> hold, on, hold on. My bad. I ain't mean to start this yet because y'all was talking we, serious topics. We just don't. We're going we're gonna to run it by the people who, uh, you know, are just tuning in and, uh, uh, you know, witnessing me being attacked on my own show um, it, in front of guests. Um, but yesterday, uh, you know. <laughs> 
I was I was attacked. Marcus ain't no Marcus ain't no guest no more. It's like when you go to somebody's house once once you've been there two or three times, you ain't no guest no more. You just go help yourself with what's in the refrigerator. So Marcus ain't but, no guest. Yeah, definitely not. You, you privy to all you privy to all the arguments and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not me though, because it's been I've been away. I've been away from the house and you know, I'm the one that pays the mortgage on this house. So I you know, I he's, he's, uh, he's a guest in my home. He's a guest in my home. But um no, so we can't be doing this too much, but I just wanna take knowledge that yesterday, um, I, you know, I was saying hello and showing love to everyone. And I said in, in our group chat, um, for 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 like it or not and though for the benjamin dixon show we have all of us in this group chat including the producers and i said hey something along along the lines of good morning you know i hope that you guys have a beautiful day right and um you know everyone was responding real kindly you know loving loving what i said and here comes Dwayne, um just attacking uh, he said to me something like what you said it was something disrespectful along the lines of like why you, you got I don't, boo it, that's what you got it was boo yeah <laughs> <laughs> he booed me first. He booed me first. And then as, you know, the day continued, he was um, putting in gifs to attack me and saying how I'm never on time and things like that. And his gifs were coming in like really tiny, um, you know, and letting me know that he has like an iPhone 3. So I'm like, how you disrespecting oh, me <laughs> in this chat see? with your iPhone 3? And then on top of that, had the nerve... Off had the nerve to tell me that, you know, I'm never on time and things like that. And I'm like, but you're only here two days a week um, and things like that. And why are you? And then he attacked me all day, y'all. I feel like it was from the morning to like literally midnight, I right? I had time yesterday. <laughs> and I felt like you have a child, like go change diapers. Like why, where is the time coming from? You know, and um, yeah, but I told him that I'll be here on time. I almost feel like they bet against it, but I told him I'll be here on time. And was I not here? At nine o'clock, you, you we do have a running bet on when you be here on time. Yeah, you was, you was, because it's like it'd be like once in every blue moon. I think it's a full moon today because you was on time today. But yeah. yesterday was just because I hadn't seen you in so long. You know, I, I had been away for a couple of days, so I had, you know, I had to get, I had to get my little jokes off. That's all. That's like, but you had time though. It, you were ghost. I was at, you I was at work. I was in, in our, chat. I was in our studio, so I was, I was at, I was at work, and we was recording something. So I was like, you know, I seen your text come through, and I was like, oh, this is perfect timing. I got, got a few minutes on my hands. Let me go ahead and yeah, respond to be, real quick. To be, you know, to be evil. It was, it was like, that, it was like that. Uh, but y'all, don't get it twisted. Just, Rebecca was throwing, was throwing shade as well too. I don't want to think that it was just Dwayne being the only one. All the rest of us just in the chat like. Thank you, buddy. Popcorn. Rebecca was coming too. Look, Thank both you. of their asses all all over the place all day yesterday. It my started, phone blown up. Off I had like a thousand then messages. I had myself. Then I had to defend myself. So <laughs> it wasn't just one Anywho. side. It wasn't just one sided. But go ahead, Rebecca. I'm gonna let you get back to your show. I, I ain't even want. I, once, you, once you said it was Women's History Month, I said, you know what? We shouldn't even do this today because I, I don't want to. You know, I'm gonna let Rebecca have her day and get on her tomorrow. But no, that's, that's all. It's, it's a whole month. But it's, it's Women's History Month, so know, you're gonna let me have the day and not the month? No, 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 no. So, <laughs> so we talk about we talk about equality and all. Marcus, that. this is like I through all the time. Can't Marcus, give you special, I can't give you special treatment. We gotta go back to the way things were. You gonna get these jokes? You know, I give you one day a pass for for not getting the jokes, but after that, it's it's back to business as usual. We are gonna respect you always, but you are gonna get these jokes. Anyways, I, I, we'll, we'll get back to that before today's show ends. Um, thank you, the Marcus, only, for being on here. This is just not, this is not how it usually is. But the I had only to thing I have that. to add is that Bubba, you might need to get some some nice sound, or maybe you know, like play some dramatic music. You know, when the start, you know, the, the <laughs> argument starts coming in. There's a, there's something about the ambiance that might be a little bit lacking, but you know, we can work that in, in post production. <laughs> in post production, right? <laughs> okay. We'll talk about that. Listen, um, over the weekend, um, not the weekend, what was the Monday? Yesterday, um, you know, friend to the show, best friend to the show, um, Olay, had conducted a rally, and that was the Get on the Freedom Bus demand release for people at Rikers Island yesterday, uh, February 28th. Um, she filled up buses, and which was beautiful, um, mm. to head over to Rikers um, to demand for the release of people that they've been holding hostage in a way. Um, and... Uh, uh, so David, who's one of our producers, um, was out there and he 
actually documented most of the whole thing. And this first clip that we'll play, it's going to be um, Ole speaking to Rikers history, uh, how the facility has been open for 90 years and it holds people awaiting trial who could not afford bail. She says 90 years of state sanctioned slavery. Let's take a listen. Mm. My name is Olaya Mealurin, and I have a question for each and every one of you. If we're innocent until proven guilty, then tell me why thousands of our brothers and sisters have been packed into cells when they haven't had a trial and they haven't been convicted of a crime. Rikers is a pre-trial detention center. The people trapped behind those walls have not been convicted of a crime. They simply do not have the money for bail. If one of us is caged, none of us is free. Because believe you me, if at any point in time a price tag can be placed on your freedom, you are never truly free at all. In the last year alone, 15 people have died in Rikers. As of last night, 16. The first death for the year has happened. I want you to really think about what's beyond us. What's beyond this bridge. I want you to think about the walls. I want you to think about the gates. I want you to take it into the barbed wire. And I want you to really think about this fact. Think about the magnitude of the security around that prison and realize this. It's not just meant to keep those people trapped inside. It's meant to keep us from looking in. Because you can't fix problems you don't know exist. You can't be outraged by horror stories you never hear and you're never told. You can't truly sympathize with the people who have been othered and silenced. And you certainly can't call for the dismantling of a system you don't see at work. Since 2001, over 370 people have died in the system. Rikers opened in 1932. 1932. That's 90 years. That's 90 years of torture. That's 90 years of rape. That's 90 years of extreme violence. That is 90 years of state-sanctioned slavery. 90 years of imprisoning poor black and brown people because they don't have the money to purchase their freedom. How much is too much? How much unspeakable trauma lives behind those walls? How many deaths is too many? I am so proud of Olay for you know, conducting this and taking the opportunity to actually go up there and talk about something that, you know, we've all known, we've all seen um, in articles and uh, people have spoken about, but she pulled up, okay? She pulled up with a bus full of people to talk about these issues. Um, I think that, you know, her pointing out the different issues that are happening there. It's not only that they're holding people, but there's rape, there's murder happening there. Um, People are in these oh my gosh, extremely terrible health conditions who aren't getting um, the medical needs um, because they're in this this jail that they feel like um, a lot of the the people there feel like they should be treated in that way because they're being jailed. This is a um, a part of um, them being reprimanded. And I don't understand, excuse me, and I don't understand, um, you know, why this is not something that is publicized. And when it is publicized, it's only, you know, in a lower level. I feel like this is something that should be all over the place. Uh, Marcus. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, but um, <laughs> A, I think what Ole is, 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 is doing is, is uh, incredibly important um, and really commendable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something like I've, I've done um, a, a reading group with uh, people in prison And, you know, it gives you a very, you know, like, then that's when she said it keeps you from looking in, um, that, that really hit close to home because the first time I walked into the prison for the reading group, I was terrified, you know, because I'd never, (laughs) I'd never been in a prison before. (laughs) Uh, I've been in a jail. We don't got to talk about that. But (laughs) when, um, (laughs) when, uh, you, when you, realize that there's human beings on you know inside of these cages you know you have to start really rectifying with what our society we are doing to these human beings um 
And uh, then you get to the point where, and like, that's the, my, my position, what, like, or at least my situation, those are people who were convicted. Now let's mm-hmm. get to Rikers, right? Where this free, liberty loving society somehow only takes poor people and locks them up for pre conviction, you know, and. Mm. Then you get into how is the treatment right within these facilities, and it's just a multi-layered atrocity, right? That that is uh, not only affecting people in Rikers, but this is across the nation. And I think what's 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 really troubling is that for all the good work Ole is doing, there's a a lot <laughs> a lot of people who are using you know uh, getting rid of cash bail which is one of the big, you know, problems in this situation as the reasons for a false rise in crime or false rise in violent crime. Um, and that's also a narrative that we got to push back. Not only that these things, these institutions are wrong, but also tearing down these institutions are not making our communities less safe, right? If that was, if, if, right. if prisons worked, would there be crime in prisons? Would you talk about rape and 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 beatings and murders? Would you talk about that stuff in inside prisons? Drugs? Does it work? Does this work? You know, obviously, no. We need to start talking about real solutions. Yes, and you're right. I'm. Go ahead, um, Bubba. Do you have anything to say? I want to make sure I get you in there because you know your internet is off, and I want to make sure I miss your your commentary. I will say I can't stand you, but it's going to take like a minute to get to you. So I can't stand you. <laughs> but no, y'all said it all said it all good, man. I, I'm proud of Ole for what she's done. And I'm, I'm glad she's uh, getting it out there. And everyone needs to see these things. Of course, you know, you have to push hard to get it to that mainstream. But mainstream is not always the way to go. You got to get it through the uh, the the. Um, Black media outlets first and those smaller independent media outlets to make sure they're getting it to their people as well, too. So shout out to Olay for what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Getting your hands dirty and being on the scene. I love that about Ole. I also love yes. that about our yes. own Georgia Ford, you know, being out there in, in the front lines um, uh, at this rally. You know, she continued and, and she she took it further. She talked about um, one of the inmates, um, the 11th inmate to die, um, the second one in a week back in um, fall of 2021 um, out there. And his name was, I believe it was Stephen Cadu. Uh, and the mother of this inmate, she made sure she brought the mother of this inmate there to actually tell the story herself. Let's take a listen. Again, every mother, every mother, every mother who has a son, who has a son in jail, in his jail system, should be outraged. Any human being should be outraged, let alone a mother that's not getting up and speaking. I'm speaking for every person in that building. Every mother, again, should be outraged on the system on how they treating people. Take action. Do something. Say something. Speak up. Do something. Then, if the Department of Correction cannot keep people alive if the department of correction cannot keep people alive they should not have them there they should let them go they should not be in their in their custody they need to decarcerate today 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 no human being should be in jail awaiting trial and die my son died because of an inhumane system my son died because of meningitis Meningitis, something that could have been curable, but they keep putting our black and brown people in here to die. When are the judges? When are the DAs? When are they going to take accountability for what are they doing? How many more people are being like me? This is my daughter here. I wake up now with one child when I had two kids for my whole entire life. Decarcerate today. Thank you. A lot of people might listen to what she's saying and hold on to the fact that she said the word decarcerate um, and say, you know, in a, um, the same way that some people feel about defunding when, you, you know, we're talking about decarcerating or, um, you know, removing this type of um, system that does not help people who are imprisoned. Um, it's basically saying there are people who are sitting in jail for no reason at all, for petty things or whatever, and 
being subjected to not getting the medical help that they need, um, not being um, able to eat properly, um, you know, mm. the conditions that they're staying in in, 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 the, in the cells are, are terrible, um, not being able to use a proper working toilet or, um, to, you know, any, there's a lot of things that go into this. This is what decarcerate today means. We shouldn't be holding people for small things um, while other people are getting off, you know, literally people who are at the Capitol 75 days in prison. This is what we're talking about here. Um, but hmm. we're like when when I think about this mother not saying that she, uh, you know, had two kids and now she only has one because her her son died of meningitis. Meningitis. Um, the, and I re, not too long ago, I was watching a video and I'm forgetting where the video took place. But I was watching a video of a young woman who was literally dying and begging for assistance, who was sick and believed to have been poisoned allegedly by one of her white cellmates. And she was literally dying, throwing up. Um, and they reprimanded her for asking for help. They literally moved her from the cell, um, from the cell with her cellmates into another cell. And then where she was, um, when she just kept begging for assistance and help, to the point where they brought her to a cell where she was by herself. She couldn't even move, tried to stand up in her own feces and everything, tried to stand up, ending up hitting her head on the, on the metal bunk bed. And that's why I, I just kind of, I'm to the point where there's so much more that goes into decarceration. We were leaving parents childless. Um, we're, we're killing women without any, without any explanation. We're, we're, we're not giving anybody any medical help. And to hear this account from the mother is totally, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm happy I had time to just, you know, <laughs> calm myself down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is I mean, it's just I, I, you said it. this is like heartbreaking. Um, but I mean, I think, yeah. And what you're saying, too, is it's is very important that the narratives of of decarceration, of defunding the police, of prison abolition, that, that these aren't these aren't things that are taken and 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 just to show like, oh, they just want to get rid of it because this this does not involve just, you know, slapping C4 to the wall of every prison, blowing up the walls and saying, well, looks like we solved that problem. No, it's about creating a society in which these things are not necessary. It's about accurately identifying the problems that are happening that are on full display. It's about solving those problems. And, if, and, and there's just so many huge ones that are apparent cash bail imprisoning people who are not guilty of any type of like not even a threat to, to, to society you're only being held by because of your poor that is insane mm -hmm. and to think that this is also the government like you can't tell me that these people belong in prison while george bush off of a, over a million iraqis is sitting free this doesn't make any sense to me mm. it doesn't make any sense you said that marcus yeah, he definitely said that. Um, and when, like I said, we go back to moments like where the Capitol happened and we were just getting news of the man that was holding the damn, um, what you call it, uh, Capitol property <laughs> and walking off, taking pictures. Right. These people are getting 75 days. These people are getting um, uh, special treatment, special diets, um, you know, the option to speak to lawyers. And these are people who who were marked terror. These are domestic terrorists, but people who are in jail for things like weed, um, a little bit of theft, you know what I'm saying? Like just standing on a corner, uh, accusations that haven't even been proven. There's so much, right? Who are serving like life sentences, you know what I'm saying? Um, or or um, not being able to go and call someone. Some people who are only in Rikers for a few days, few days, few weeks, not being able to go call someone. Some people who have what, um, I remember we were talking about dollar bails and things like that. Not even able to go speak to a lawyer or get that opportunity because for some reason, Rikers believes that, um, you know, to hold them there and not give them anyone to talk to is going to be something that helps them go back into the world to be a better person. I don't know what system, what idea, like, you know, the system is broken 
and it's especially broken for people who look like us, but Olay has been on the show and she's even shown how when it was, uh, there were no more beds, no more places to put anybody, any person at Rikers. And they were all on top of each other in the middle of the pandemic. This is at the height of the pandemic. They were all on top of each other looking for little spaces to sleep. Some of them, few of them had masks on. Some of them were probably coming out. And the only reason that they probably had masks on was because they were just thrown in there from going, you know, from being jailed, from going out or whatever the case may be. The, the Rikers, the whole system of it, they do not care. But so much money is being put into other areas in New York. And I think this is, this is where we, we see where it's very, very problematic. Um, Olay does go on to speak more about, um, and we're going to go to X5, Dwayne, but she does go um, m um, on to speak more about um, Rikers. And she says, you know, the myth of Rikers, saying that Rikers doesn't house convicted prisoners. It holds people who are awaiting trial. And Rikers continues to kill those people. Uh, she said, so much for innocent proven guilty. Let's take a look. Okay. I want to address a myth. There's a popular, popular misconception that Rikers is a terrible place for terrible people. Rikers is a terrible place. Full stop. Full stop. <laughs> the people locked up in Rikers are not there because they're terrible people. They are just the people the state had the opportunity to put there. Anybody who gets arrested in New York City, that's where they send them if you don't have the money for bail. Anybody. It's not a place because these people are exceptionally awful. The only thing they have in common is poverty. That's the only thing they have in common. And there's been a lot of talk about the amount of people that have died by suicide in Rikers, and I want to say this. If people take their lives because of the conditions you put them through, because of the horror you subject them to, because of what their state has done to them, that is not a suicide, that is losing your life at the hands of the state. Yeah. A civil society puts its money where its priorities are at. There's no reason that the NYPD and Rikers have billions and billions and billions more dollars than we get for homelessness, yeah. than we get for education, yeah. than we get for health, than we get for absolutely any, any resource. It's unacceptable for us to even have to have this conversation. It's unacceptable for a structure like this to stand for 90 years. And I want you to think about this. I asked you in the beginning how much unspeakable trauma you think lives behind those walls. How much unspeakable trauma you never hear. You never, ever, ever hear about. And think about this. We're gathered here today. We came all the way out here today and they will not let us pass this point. Why do you think that is? What is it that they don't want you to see? What is it that they don't want you to hear? Today we say no more. One person died last night. I don't want to hear about another one. I don't want to hear about another one. So, in the end, I want to say this to y'all. Shut it down. Come on, Ole. She was free. I said, Ole, you was in the house, girl. I was aiming. Listen. Yeah. It is, it, we must act now. I know we say that all the time and people don't be acting, but Ole gonna act, okay? She's gonna be there, she's gonna pull up. What is it that, that Rikers does not want you to see? People are dying way too often, so what is it that they don't want you to see? Why, um, you know, is it that money is being put so much into this place? Rikers didn't have nobody running it for a while. The inmates were running it during the pandemic. OK, mm -hmm. the inmates were running it during the pandemic, having to save themselves, having to figure out how to maneuver during this time, because correctional officers uh, leadership there was not pulling up. This did not make national news. This did not make national news at all. The leaders who were up for reelection or election came over there maybe once or twice to come um, check the people out, never came back again said, okay, we're going to work on, we're going to do an in investigation, we're going to move forward, we're trying to get them the help that they need, never returned again. So much so that Rikers, the Rikers inmates had to save themselves. And this tells us all that we need to, do, need to know. As she said, somebody died the night before. 
People are dying literally all the time at Rikers and with no reasoning. And they just believe that it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a thing that happens. They probably died because, you know, if they were sick or whatever the case may be. Did they get sick from, from being in those con- inhumane conditions? How they were being treated? Were they raped? Were they beaten? The trauma, the trauma that is behind those walls. That to me was deep. Earlier on in, in, in um, the morning show, we heard, we heard Georgia speaking about trauma for us who go out and protest and how we got trauma and things like that. Those people are supposed to be considered rehabilitated with the trauma that they are, they're experiencing, for the trauma that they went in with, the trauma that they experienced within that place and to come out into the world limited in what they can do. And that's supposed to be considered rehabilitation. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it, it, yeah, and I think too, like where I do want to highlight some of that, like an experience that I had with one of the the, the, the prisoners that I was able to like just just know. Um, this gentleman was arrested two weeks after his 18th birthday. He spent all but those two weeks and a few months of his life as as a ward of the state jesus right he's he was a a technically a free american for two weeks commits a crime it's all his fault he's in prison for a decade and a half at least he doesn't say i didn't do anything wrong but for us to ignore (laughs) <laughs> what this really is like it it's a crime in itself right for us mm-hmm. to ignore the conditions that society has built for uh, for us that lead to these things to ignore it is a crime to ignore how we're dealing with these things in Riker, rikers island and prisons and jails and prisons across america private private prisons <laughs> you know this is a this is a yeah. crime like the idea that you, I mean, there's just the simple, I am gaining money. I'm gaining capital from the imprisonment and slave labor of individuals. We mm. know what that is. Yes. We know what that is. And it's happening every day. Yeah. There's so much Ooh. that goes into and it. You know, slave labor is- yeah. And I was Go about ahead. to say the the exact same thing. You know, it's it's all money. The, you know, they the more bodies they have in, the more money that they get, and it and it mm-hmm. sucks that it's like that because Rikers is the prime example. They literally, and, and my thought process of how they how I feel that they sit down and they talk about it is, you know what. They did this on the slave ships, so maybe we start laying people one way and stacking them another way. We can start maximizing our benefits and start making more money and get more money out of these people. Oh, it's just meningitis. He'll be okay. Don't worry about him. That's more money we got to spend. We can save those $5 that we're going to give him for medicine and just go ahead. And He'll be okay. He'll live. He'll be going to court maybe like a week or so. And yeah. the, I'll tell you, too, all of these people at Rikers, the people running Rikers, they're going to run over to Eric Adams, Mr. Top Cop mm. Mayor, Tuh. and they're saying they are going to use these deaths to increase their budgets. Are they going to spend any of that money taking care of people? Nope. Talk about it. And, th- and I think that's a, I don't understand why there's a reverse effect when people start to say, hey, we must stop this, you know, you know inhumane activity actions happening over there there's um there's no medical support to support these uh inmates there's not enough food there's not enough bed there's not enough housing for them here um you know and what happens is they go to the leadership the leadership says you know what we'll continue we'll fund it that's what we'll do we'll fund it we'll give it more money help it grow yeah, that's what we'll do. And the funding is there, but we don't see the change. We don't see nothing, mm. no benefits from that. I don't understand why that is. I remember um, just recently when we were talking about defunding the police, right? And that doesn't mean that we, we're, not, we're saying that we don't need police. That does not mean that we're saying that police are all bad people. That's not what we're saying, right? But that's how people take it. But we've been saying defund the police. All of a sudden, these mofos getting blessed with more money with more money, more ammunition, 
and we're seeing more black bodies, right? This is what, I don't I don't understand why this is a thing, but anyways, I digress. It's a lot of mess happening over there. I think that we should continue to um, use our voices and our platforms. Um, and as you said, Bubba, like having black media out there to get the word out, but you know, having these people who are actually true hearted, genuine, genuine about the work, genuine in getting these people help, genuine in pushing for leadership to stop this, to acknowledge it, you know? And, and it's funny because the number of people who, you know, decided to get on that, those buses is, is, is amazing already. And to go out there and to stand in solidarity with a push for change at Rikers. Um, and then the number of people who have the conversations in social media space is enough for it to get national media attention. But because it's just problematic to uh, attack, especially leadership out there in New York and tell them that they, you know, they're holding... You, Rikers is is not an, a, a running prison. The the prisoners are running it. This is something they're not getting any. It's pay. It's slave labor. There's so many people dying. Questionable deaths that are happening there. But they don't want that. They don't. The connections. The national media does not want those stories to be told. And I think I thank God that we have these um, platforms that we can tell it ourselves. So shout yeah. out to Olay Mama. Thank you for so much for doing that. Shout out to our producer David for going out there and joining the movement, joining the fight. Um, I know this is going to be an ongoing thing as she's constantly covering uh, the issues at Rikers. So we'll definitely continue to talk about this story as it develops. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to stay live today. Marcus, if you can stay with us for the after show, if you have time um, for the next 30 minutes. But um, we're going to uh, have some talks about Ukraine, some of the racial issues that are happening amongst this war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that and more coming up right after this. I'm on sabbatical. I'm out of Central America. I need a break from hysteria. Park like the one with the carousel. I get it lit in your area. I'm locked to the vision. They couldn't be clear. You can't pay me to care enough. <laughs> Dare you to hate me. Supreme with the sound of the stereo. So turn it up loud when you hear it us. We live in this good in your area. My mama proud. She tearing up and it's going down. Got your girl aroused. Got these massive stacks like a hundred pounds. When big laps. So the sun is down like a hundred miles. All right, y'all. Make sure y'all stay down. tuned, man. We are staying live this morning. So make sure that you stay tuned. Like we got more Red coming one, up. If I hold you down, more I'm going to get you down to me. Don't like Jet it, black when I paint the town, only blue sheets when they pay me now. Treat a setback like a step back. Wait, I got the game and advice grip. Way up when the virus clear. All the homies on the flight list. So Where over the weekend, let me tell you what I did. Twisted, I actually lit the spray deodorant in my hands. Won't stop from relentless. Now when I talk, I have this weird accent. Ray gun on safety. My girl's so tasty. Tell her it's your world. She wants the two-tone spaceship. It's gonna go. Ghost yeah, screen yeah, daily. Yeah. So the stress don't face me. Yeah. Boy, I want a grill for the mouthpiece. So write that a light on my face. Your shawty just call me a fave. Cause she like my character traits. I never stop for a break. I put a lock on the game. I put a stock in my name. But I give a f about the fame. I took a bite out of life and it tastes so exquisite. It feel like you're doing it. Good morning, y'all. Make sure y'all stay tuned. Hope it's romantic. My girl, yeah, she's up for the kid. I'm not on no sense. Won't stop to the young easy dreams. When I take her from rags to riches. I heard that you claim that you know me. But you ain't the homie, the f is your friendship. I need the laws to see back up the royalty. I give a f if you notice me. Ain't nobody holding me. Big wave at your short line, so they know it's me. Bay boy from the cold seas. Nitro with a new pen. Go at ISO, tell them don't reach. Ice cold with a no fleece. I'ma need safety. Tell the op can't snake me. Ray gun off safety. My girl's so tasty. Tell the it's hey, your world. Never blame someone else for the roads you are on. Never blame someone else for the roads you are on. Hey man, I got home from work uh, yesterday to find my kids have been on eBay all day. Hey. They still on that tomorrow. I'm lower the price. <laughs> All right, y'all, I think we are ready to come back. Yeah, no, maybe so. 
All right, y'all. Welcome back to the screen, my sister and brother, Mister Rebecca Zora, and our brother Marcus from Left Lane Dance. What is the sound giving me over here? It's giving me Florida on a hot day with the, you know, what I'm saying the Chevy donks. I just, it's a lot. It's a lot happening. It's a lot happening. It's, it's got to be this fam you internet making everything sound like trunk rattling and everything <laughs> on them big ass tires in Florida and everything. Yes. Flip flops you know, and socks on and all of that. Yes. You know the black flip. All the Haitians black with their little shirts off with their little stomachs out. You know, yeah, all the Haitians with the Zoe flag in the car or the, and you know how it is in Florida for some odd reason, these people, and I thought that was so sexy as a child. See, that's my Florida side. They will literally pull up in Chevys or whatever and have it painted. It, and like somebody will have like a Haitian flag um, painted on the car. So the theme of the car is like Haiti. Some other people will have like Rocco's Modern Life painted on the car. And that's the theme of it. Somebody had a Facebook Chevy, bro. And that would be they have Monte Carlos, <laughs> right? They got Monte Carlos sitting on God knows what. Like inside yellow, outside yellow, and then they got the word yellow in black on the car. It's crazy. That's literally, it is crazy. Pull up with Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton printed cars. Like, oh, I know Louis Vuitton made that. Right, Gucci printed cars. <laughs> but why was they so fine to me? The men that used to drive it. Now that's my Florida side, See? and I was. Just, I was dating a guy in in high school, my first boyfriend, senior year. He literally had a Chevy that had like that sat so high in order for me to get in the car. He had and I'm tall. He had to literally like kind of scoop me up to get up in there. The first one got stolen. He went out and purchased another one. What did he do? You know, now that I think about it. How did he get a new one literally in two weeks and then put the rims on it again? I don't know. I don't know. Like yeah, if you have to ask business. what did he do? <laughs> Right, Marcus. <laughs> Leave him alone. I was a kid. I was a child. I don't. I didn't know. <laughs> if you had to ask what he did, then don't worry soon. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Don't do worry it. about it, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, we don't gotta talk about and that. You no said more. Florida. Crazy. Uh, 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 uh. uh, 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 uh South Florida, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's crazy. But um, oh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and he Haitian. Well, and he Haitian. But um, yeah, no. Um, there's so much going on in the world. I'm glad that we're able to um key key here. But there are a lot that there's a lot that's going on in the world. I first want to start with um friend to the show, um, Terrell Starr, who was one of, early on, when we started Like It or Not, back in the, uh, what, 2017s, um, he was one of the people that um, was a friend to the oh, show, yeah. who used to give us um, Russia, Russia specialties for stories, and uh, he was our expert, and what was great about it is that he's a black man, um, which I absolutely love. He's somebody who lived out there, who understands it, and is currently living in Ukraine, um, and Recently on CNN, he had the opportunity to actually have a first-hand account while on air with CNN explaining the situation. Let's take a look at that. Terrell Germain Starr is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlanta Council's Eraser Center and senior reporter at The Root. Terrell, give us a sense of what you're seeing now. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I'm not at The Root, by the way, but what I'm seeing right now are men walking, you know, are, they're being handed guns right now. I'm outside of a recruitment center. I cannot take video, and I don't want to spook out these um, these men with these automatic rifle weapons, so I have the camera kind of tilted. But basically, you have men walking up in their cars, uh, people who are not, um, you know, people who are traditionally uh, 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 fighters coming in and taking up arms to fight for guerrilla warfare. Um, you, you see a lot, you, you see people who are taking their roller baggage trying to flee the city as fast as they can. Uh, you, you, there are also some damage to buildings inside of the city proper, about 15 minutes from where I live. In fact, a building was hit, and it was a residential building. So this war has completely unraveled his business. Um, students that he depended on to come to the United, that, that come yeah. from the United yeah. States, yeah. that come from the United Kingdom, are no longer coming because of this. So he sent his family to Poland right now saying that you will go to Poland, be safe. I'm going to stay here and fight for my country. But Andre right here, uh, he speaks English. He's um, one of the many people who are coming to uh, to pick up arms. He's getting a weapon yes. to fight the Russians. How far is he willing to go? What does he think will happen? What do you think will happen to you, Andre, if you 
uh, and, and others go to the streets and fight the Russians? What, what are you expecting to see? Uh, uh, well, I expect, I expect to see a battle. I expect to see a, a gun battle, and uh, I expect to see that we're going to send them a message that they are not welcome here. Let's put it this way. And so, you know, right about a 10 to 15 minute walk from our uh, building, uh, it, a residential area was hit, and that building could have very easily have been us. And it really speaks to how much danger that everyone in Kiev, including myself, who's reporting on this, um, this if the situation is in danger, in fact. Um, and again, shout out to Terrell, who is not at the root, who is no longer at the root, as he made, uh, you know, clear um, on CNN. But uh, he is somebody who, you know, has a relationship with mostly like everybody that he runs into. He has these relationships with these different people and this, um, you know, uh, this this teacher, this um a language teacher uh, who he befriended actually is taking up arms, um, you know, while he and he was over there with him in the car as he went to go pick up a weapon <clears throat> somewhere um, to prepare for battle. Um, and, and as this interview continues, um, you hear him, you hear Terrell ask him, uh, you know, when were you able to have that conversation with your wife and your child if you don't come back? And he said, I, I wasn't able to have that conversation with them, but they understand, they know that I'm going to go fight for my country. And if you hear a lot of account of the people that live there, that, you know, the Ukrainians that are there, that's a lot of what all of them are saying is that I'm going to fight for my country. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a trained soldier. I'm not, I'm not trained in military, but I'm going to take arms and I'm going to go fight. Um, and Terrell being there, being on the scene, actually giving you the story for what it is. It's very chilling, um, his, his whole accounts of what's been going on. Yeah. His, you know, his residential area being, being struck. That's, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot to take in. Uh, yeah, and um, I don't know, this is a very difficult, you know, situation to, in like all war, right, is, 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 is it's difficult to like, just saying this is good, bad, and, you know, like, um, obviously the invasion's wrong. This is horrible. Like, you know, like, innocent civilians are getting killed. Um, and, and and like I was saying, you know, I was on earlier with, with uh, Brother Mac and Al and, and, and uh, Captain Barnes, and I don't, I don't know if the conversation ever goes to where do we go from here. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, like, it's just... I don't know. It's it's hard yeah. living in this reality where it almost feels like we're in the Colosseum and we're all watching Please. a battle unfold on our phones. Um, and um, I mean, and that really too, like my organization, you know, left flank, we 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 don't think joining the U.S. military was was good. <laughs> you know, we think that was a mistake wow. that we made in our lives. Um, and it's, it's largely with the operations that we got involved, you know, that we were told to do. And, and this is where too of like, I, I, I hope Russian soldiers that, you know, like go, go home, go home. You know, I hope, <laughs> I hope any and all soldiers that aren't just defending their home, just go home, lay down your arms and go home. Um, mm -hmm. because this, this doesn't end well. And, um, none of this serves working class people, you know, uh, this, and, and I, I just hope that like, there's a serious piece that is being considered. Um, yeah. because yeah, I, I, what I, I, yeah, my question is like, really like, yeah, at this point we know Putin isn't going to stop. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the point of NATO is, <laughs> you know, if they're not going to help, right. Then, then why not just step back, you know? And that's, that's I, don't, I don't understand that, you know. Baba? It's a lot, you know. Um, it's really a lot. But, you know, watching everything, because like Marcus said, you just really don't know how everything is going to unfold and play out. Um, I know we've avoided so many situations with Russia before, but it's now it's one of those things of... How much is the U.S. going to get involved? And are they going to start sending our troops on over there to do everything and try to help with this battle? Um, I do know that the people of Ukraine, they have a resiliency about themselves where they are fighting back and they are holding them back. But 
how much more can they take and how much more can they do? You know, it, it's just really a lot. It's really disheartening to see everything going on and how everything is going on. And I'm just hoping that, you know, there's a hacker group called Anonymous. I've heard of Anonymous for years now, and I'm hearing that they're starting to do their own cyber attacks on Russia. So now I'm just hoping that the people in Russia start fighting back against their own government and their own country and expressing their disdain for what Putin is starting doing, because I already know that some of them are not feeling it. So I just hope that it gets it goes out more. <laughs> it, sometimes we have strength in numbers where the people can assist in these types of things. So I just hope that that does happen. I just, I just hate how everything is transpiring. I really do. Yeah. Um, I think whew, it's a mess, right? Oh my um, gosh, man. We're, we're not trying to like, for it's, I think it's a mess for the, the people period. I don't think any of the leadership is considering the people war is not good there. And, and I know there's been jokes yeah. that have been made and little kikis. And I honestly, you know, have been looking online. I'm like this is, it's a little too early. It's not the time. There are people who war, nothing about war is funny. Um, and, and seeing it from this point of view back in the day, we didn't know what it looked like when our people were the ones with the yeah. blood on their hands in these different countries like Afghanistan and things like that. We didn't know what that looked like. Now I'm looking at this. We have social media. We can see the firsthand accounts. And to think that there was a point in time that we were those, we were like that. We were literally pulling up on people's um, land, killing them for absolutely what? Nothing. Mm. Nothing. Um, and so when I see that, I, I, you know, I think of, I think of us, I think of Americans, I think of that, you know, we're looking at, in, in a mirror, uh, when I see that. And that's my opinion. But honestly, I don't think any of the leadership is thinking about the people, um, you know, those not being able to go. But of course, as people who are very proud to be who they are, uh, these people have been free for what, out of, uh, Russia's, uh, you know, le leadership for about what, 30 years. So, you know, them having this freedom for such a short amount of time, um, and then literally having the same folks <laughs> who, you know, come up on them to try to take that away from them. Of course, they're going to fight for their, you know, they're going to fight for their nation. And, um, Here's the thing. With that being said, I'm glad we were able to put that, you know, conversation there. In the same sense, with everything that we know, for some odd reason, when it comes to being black in the issue, it's a problem. Um, you know, most recently online, if we know over the weekend, um, Africans in Ukraine was actually trending. And a lot of people, you know, had their opinions on as to why it was trending. Um, but when you clicked on the tag, you would see one of the most um, riveting t um, tweets that I seen was um, one from Enze and, uh, you know, who's an African in Kiev. He said in the train stations in um, Kiev, children first, women second, white men third, then the remaining is occupied by Africans. This means that we have waited for many hours for trains here and couldn't enter because of this, this being them being black. Majority of Africans are still waiting to go to, and I hope I'm saying this right, Lviv. Um, and so now he takes a picture um, and he's showing how uh, the Africans that were at the back of the line um, and, you know, what that looked like. They were at the back of the line from the train. And some people were saying that wasn't true. Now, many other African students who were there or African families started to come onto social media, post up other videos of the account. Um, then he posted up um, a video where he said, we had to start shouting and pushing African women to the train. So they had no other option than to allow them since they said women and children first. So they utilized the wording. They were like, well, you said women and children first. You, you, so we're going to at least get these um, women on, these black women on, with the other women who are going on so that they can get to where, they, where they're where they going. Another account that I seen was a woman who said that, you know, when they got to where they, uh, one of the areas that they were supposed to get to finally, they were treated and they, like, trashed. They weren't giving any food, any food or anything. When they finally got to, I believe they said, Warsaw, Poland, which, which was the destination for them, they said they were treated much better when they finally got there, but they spent nights at the train stations. They spent, um, you know, without food. I seen a video of a two month old baby in the freezing cold outside. And it, it, it almost looked like the Haitians at the border of Texas. He, it, it almost was given that to me. And they were being treated 
without, they just were being treated terribly. So, so many people were trying to take to social media to assist, find assistance, find help. Even um, some of celebrity rappers were trying to figure out how they can get them assistance. And some people were saying, why are we talking about race in this time? Why are we talking about, you know, when we're not focusing on the war? I said, well, how can we hmm. not focus on what's happening? The black people, even in the midst of a war, have to deal with being black in this, and being pushed back to the end in of midst everything. Of a war. Yes, and not being um, assisted, Marcus. Well, I, I'm going to take it in, you know, kind of a different lane because I agree. I co-signed, seconded, repeat everything that you just said. You know, like when it comes to racism, it needs to be addressed right now, right now. I do not care what the situation is. Um, but I think how how this looks and like and this is the thing, too, is like when we get into the social media, like just insurgents that we have in this world where everything minute by minute we're getting more and more and more um really ukraine government and and this is why people don't want to hey we know we can't talk about we can't talk about this why because of the 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 sentiments oh are you tr are you a putin apologist are you trying to help putin because they're trying to talk about black people no that's absolutely absurd and every in, in like each sense right because even if this is a mistake you need to accurately address the mistake for people to know that you aren't racist right you need to say oh mm -hmm. man i had no we didn't know this you were doing what guards over you were doing what you know but you don't see any of that you sh 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 sweep it under the rug and and this is where two of the and like this is a, like that's the thing is putin is using the line that there are Nazis and like there are significant Nazis in Ukraine making the decisions. Okay. He is using that as a narrative, as a pre-context to invade. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, when you've got situations like this, when you've got situations where the Ukrainian national guard is sharing videos of people loading, you know, or say like like dipping bullets in pork lard to kill Muslims and like calling them orcs. Like the there is a problem, and not addressing that problem is actually feeding into Putin's narrative that there is a yeah. a, a substantial Nazi problem in Ukraine that they need to invade to stop. It like once like and it's not. Like you can't invade countries and start killing innocent people, you know, and and so that's 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 where like the really like the problem problematic thing on like the higher level is when 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 whether it's Ukraine, the EU, NATO, the United States, like people online, anytime you try and brush all this stuff up under the rug instead of addressing it and confronting it in this specific position, it's actually giving Putin a little bit more legitimacy. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it, like, I, I don't know what to say to that. You know, like we're, this is just where it. we're at now, you know? Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Bubba. Uh, agreed. You know, it's with this whole situation. I know that there have been like different accounts and everything and stuff going on, but I'm just like, you can say all you want to about a lot of this, it's the videos and the footage. I mean, it, it doesn't lie. It, it speaks for itself. I've seen video where there are white Ukrainians that are pushing their Ukrainians, pushing the black people off the train or not letting them board or do these things. So it's hard to believe somebody tell me or say that I heard X, Y, Z. Once we see the footage ourselves and it looks like they're not getting the same uh, amount of respect or being treated the same as everybody else is. So it, it, yeah. it's, it's a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are different stories to everything, but just from what I see myself looking at it, they're being treated inhumanely and it needs to change. This, yeah. when we have and, a damn war, man, it's, it's that's crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. And we should be able to talk about both. We should be able to talk about both. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. that 
We're watching this um, with our own eyes. We're hearing the accounts, and why would we ignore it just to focus on just the war? These these Africans, these black people uh, who are in Ukraine, who who are probably just in the border or trying to move, whatever, in that area in the midst of this war, the, they're people who are going through the war as well. And they're also being pushed to the back of the line, no matter what time they would got at the train station. If you are black, you just don't get assistance, and it shouldn't be like that. We have to acknowledge what is happening there. Um, you know, Ukraine people should be sh to be safe. The, the black people who were born in Ukraine should be safe. The students who were, uh, you know, going there for education should be safe. People, period, who yeah. are seeking asylum, anything out of Ukraine should be safe, should be treated, uh, should not be uh, uh, mistreated because of the color of their skin. It is not us saying that the war isn't going on if we're acknowledging the racism that's going yes. on. Because we have to understand that at this point, the black people are dealing with more than one war, okay? The war of racism and the war that's happening right there at the border. So I need for people to understand it's not like it's not that we're saying that oh my goodness we we're we we're, we're trying to divert from focusing on the war this is what putin would want no we're adding it to exactly to what's going on and we're saying that people matter since y'all don't want to talk about it since it's a hard thing for people to talk about it especially racist we're saying that all people matter in this particular since y'all want to say all lives matter in this particular situation that's what we're trying to push and we have to acknowledge that the black folks there they matter too so when we have these conversations, this is something that we're talk what we will continue to talk about as this is ongoing. Um, a lot of people are discussing alleged abuse that's also happening. Uh, you know, I'm following different accounts, um, and um, you know, people are looking for places to seek asylum. Um, in the midst of trying to travel. So there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of, you know, social media conversations. But one thing about it over here, what we will do is have the conversation. All right. Yeah. So we're towards the end of the show now. Um, and I think that we have so much to talk about that we can um, go into tomorrow as well. But I am so happy that you were able to join the conversation today, Marcus. First of all, where are you from? You know, like, what? tell me a little bit about you. What? Where are you from? Where they found you at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, well, I'm kind of a mutt. Uh, as far, but like my my parents were Jamaican, and they came over into like the '80s. But we had come all up and down. So I was born in Texas, but I grew up mostly in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, um, I did live a little bit in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, was when I was growing up. So like, and yeah, that's you know, like Columbus is my home. But I've lived all over Maine and everything like that. I joined the military. Um, mm. I have a few years after high school when I was just kind of like spinning my tires. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. I, I've been all over the world and, uh, with, 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 with the Marines and, um, the gate, that, that perspective is what really started, you know, shifting my, or actually building my political ideology. But, um, so of me and a, a few other veterans, uh, worked, on a vets for Bernie for 2016, 2020, um, early leading up to, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and, 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 you know, with what happened with the, the campaigns, we had, you know, kind of all spiraled out and, you know, uh, into our own projects. Um, and, uh, you know, myself and a few others, we started left flank vets just to be, yeah, just kind of a voice out there that is in opposition of the you know pro war pro troops you know narrative um and 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 the thing is and, and like you just said uh you, we we need to be able to hold conflicting ideas you know in our heads at once you know that it's not the fault of these individual troops it's the systems at play you know um and uh and so yeah you know i think i'm not even sure really how how you know i think i just saw the email or that's what David had, had messaged uh, when I was when I was streaming and like, hey, Marcus, do you want to come on Ben Dixon's show? And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Uh, so does, so, does uh, David know you personally? No, and actually, I gotta like shout out to some of y'all mods like Jam Two, Samuel and the Dragon on Twitch. You know, these are people who are just good good genuine people that i think did a lot of work behind the scenes to 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 can make this connection um okay. so yeah i think that might have been it um so thank you all <laughs> thank you all oh. and, and, and and david too was like i mean this 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 dude works his ass off and um 
Yeah. Just him reaching out, you know. Yeah. That so, white yeah, man works he does. behind we, we, off. He sure do. He sure do. <laughs> I can't and stand I you, Rebecca. I right. We so we have some amazing viewers and they 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 DM us and they talk a lot. It was like, oh yeah, you guys need to check this person out, check this person out, and check this person out. So shout out to our viewers, man. We really appreciate y'all. They do. Thank you guys for connecting um, you know, us with other black professionals, other professionals, period. I, I absolutely love yeah. uh, to bring people on to our show who are, you know, fighting the same fight with us, pushing, you know, the same messages or educating us on new messages, you know, and I absolutely love that. So, Marcus, before we leave, where can they find you? Twitch.tv slash left flank vets um, bird app on Twitter. Just search for left flank vets. You'll find us. Um, we haven't touched our Instagram or Facebook in months because, you know, I'm just <laughs> not so I don't have fun on those platforms, but those two places right. I will be streaming <laughs> at uh, around noon. Right. And like, that's the thing is like, Rebecca, I feel you on not being, you know, like on time doesn't have to be so serious. Okay. Um, but it'll be and, and there's around... somebody who's talking from the military. Okay. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Look. Cause they always say, hurry up and wait, hurry up. Like you gotta be on time so you can wait three hours. I might as well not show up on time. Then. <laughs> um, exactly. so, Mar Marcus, I ain't, around got, noon. I ain't got no problem with her being late. Right. It's just, I got it. I got, she got it. She got to catch these jokes, man. And then she be trying to throw me under the bus, right? She, she be late and she tried to throw me under the bus. Like, oh, I've been waiting in the joint. Well, you just going to You know what, fair. Because uh, sometimes you're not boxing. You're just shadow boxing. You know, this is supposed to be fun. Right. I get <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's Taco Tuesday. What we eating today? Did, I, did you mute me? I can't hear. I can't hear nobody. Oh, we're, we're waiting for you to close it up. Right. Oh. <laughs> see? Oh, look. See? I, I, see? see? see okay, I'm... anyways, we're at the end of the show. I love you guys so much. It is Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Go get you a taco. Go be great. Um, if you guys want to pay for my taco today, it's uh, cash tag Becca's voice. I love you guys so much. Mean it. Mwah. Enjoy the rest of your day. You can't stand that girl, y'all. Thank y'all again so much for joining us this morning, man. We had a jam-packed morning show this morning. It was the best morning show. I said a whole lot of words at one time that played them. So. Marcus, thank you so much again for joining us this morning. It was always a pleasure. Dwayne, thank you for holding it down. And, of course, your affirmation. You already did that. Let me find a good affirmation for today. Yes. Here we go. In everything I do, I turn to self-compassion, which makes me strong. In everything I do, I turn to self-compassion, which makes me strong. Love y'all mean it. Y'all go They want me good. I amplify. And I am going to lay off the top. Love y'all mean it. We'll see y'all in the morning. Don't let you bow to the queen. Lose all your senses and reason. I'll give you something to believe.